Hello everyone, welcome on and happy Thursday. It is Thursday. I'm shocked that tomorrow is Friday. How's everyone doing today? Chat, first today was BitGaming. BitGaming has knocked Smike. Well, yesterday Smikes was knocked off by Music Girl. And today again by Bit Gaming Bit. How did you do that? How did you do that? I know Smite was here, like but doesn't count. Ew, I don't even like you a little it doesn't bit. count, Debs. I I'm telling you, you like had the, the redemption. Um, well, maybe just a little bit. Debs, it's like when you go walking. It's wind, like when you go walking. If you're not wearing a Fitbit, does it even count? Does it even count? Because nothing's actually counting your steps, Debs. Ipso facto, you're not. You're not actually taking any steps at all, you know. Hello, Debs, as well. The lovely Debs in his house. Bex! Hello, Bex. Come here! Hit it! <gasps> Hello, Cliff House. for McLean. Cliff, how are you doing, Cliff? Optic Nerve in the house. How are you doing, Optic Nerve? Metal Meows! Hello, Metal Meows. Welcome the heck in. Mick Zenith, hello. Becca's Crafty Life, hello, hello. Travel the world. It's great to see you travel the world. Travel the world. I sent you a special item today, Travel the World. Uh, Dara's leaking or Dev's leaking? Hi, Coffee Rocks! Travel the world. Thank you for the 100 bitties, Travel the World. Um, we also have, let's see, we have a, a new GIF and a new sound alert for those who are interested. New GIF and a new sound alert for y'all who are interested today. Um, let me see. Catching up on chat. Becca! Hi, Becca. Becca, how are you doing no! today? Becca, you said you're not feeling great today. You have to call out sick. Oh, no, because the asthma. Did they, Becca, did they resolve the water issue? Is there any resolution to that, Becca? Hi, Crux. No, I'm glad that there's no sorries for me today, Crux. How you doing, Crux? Welcome on in. Gwendolyn B. Hello, Gwendolyn B. How you doing, Gwendolyn B? Gwendolyn B. It's great to see you, Gwendolyn B. Chat. No, they didn't resolve it. Ugh. Becca, I am so frustrated on your behalf, ma'am, about the chat. There is, um, hi Lilith, Becca is not allowed to get water at her work, like to go have a beverage item. And that to me seems on its own kind of messed up. So I don't, I'm angry. I'm angry. Uh, Gwen, here are the ants. There's some crawling there. And then, yeah, this back here, that's the fungus. Now, Gwen, this was up here. So it's it's shrinking, Gwen. So I even though you see there's ants coming back and forth, here's their trash pile. You can see a bunch of them working on the trash, like they're moving trash out and around. I keep ent ex you know taking it out and like cleaning out the trash, but Gwen, it is, yeah, it, it's shrinking, which is weird because um, <clears throat> they're still cutting leaves, so that's what makes it like extra weird on that front. Coco, 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 indeed, Smikes. Coco, indeed, Smikes. Just gonna leave it. I'm not okay. I, Becca, I think part of that is for your health. I wouldn't say that's being complaining. I think no matter what medical condition you may or may not have, like with the asthma, I think it's still important to be able to 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 drink and stay hydrated throughout the day. Um, I could only imagine how sick I would feel if I weren't allowed to hydrate during the day. I and mean, that's not, that's not like because I have asthma or anything. It's just because, you know, the human body is not built to not hydrate. Um, but yeah, Gwen, I think it's shrinking. I, I, again, I have not looked closely to find any queen body, Gwen. If there is one, it might be here. I know it's not just for you, Becca, but it's, it's, it's sus for everyone. You know, like, like as Smikes is saying, it's not just... For your like your particular position, it's for anyone should be able to like have water, right? It's just I don't like it, Becca. I don't like it. But Gwen, the body might be here, or and it's not here. This is what I've been cleaning out. Um, hi, Digital Deck, welcome. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure. Again, Becca my, or Gwen, my suspicion is that the colony is shrinking down, unfortunately. Speaking of, folks, there was a prediction earlier today. It did Balint get haircutted, folks. Did Balint get haircutted? The correct answer is with 150 channel points on the line. We were being very stingy today. The correct answer is, in fact, no. Congratulations to everyone who voted no. I did not get a haircut. No one gets haircutted on a Thursday, folks. 
on a haircut at getting a Thursday, a haircut on a Thursday, it doesn't happen. No one gets haircutted on a Thursday. Fridays may be a Friday because you're going into the weekend, you're getting ready to like have a good time. You know, beyond that, no, no, not on a, never on a Thursday. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe possibly tomorrow. Um, all right. So, chat. I want y'all to tell me what you're feeling tonight in terms of what topic to discuss. I've got. I'm kind of queued up for a couple of things. One is we I'll have. Thank you, Thank you, How's Lita doing? She's doing all right, Glenn. She's doing all right. Um, she's hanging out with the little one now. She's tired. Little one is taking a nap right now, so Lita's like, maybe I'll, I'll put her in her bed and also take a nap in there. Uh, I have not seen any message, Becca. I have not seen any message. Um, I feel like I'm going to... Yes. Wrong, wrong Becca Smikes. I think you mean B-E-C-C-A. But yes, I totally understand. Totally understand, Master Smikes. Um, <clears throat> which, what message, Becca? I'm so sorry. I don't know which one you're talking about. Um, giant centipedes, yes. So Cliff is on point. One had a redemption for giant centipedes at some point. To tell you when Cliff that redemption was, I can't even tell you, Cliff. It was long enough ago where it was, you know, it was a fair bit of time ago. Uh, check out. I I have not looked back. I'm so sorry. If it was while we were live, I do not look at Discord while we were live unless there's an emergency from one of my mods. I tend not to look. Um. But I will look afterward, Becca. I will look afterward. So one side, one thing that we could talk about is giant centipedes. Um, some of their neat biology, in particular the papers that are out on them. <sighs> Unfortunately, they're not especially great in terms of molecular biology. But there was one that was more of a physics slant where you actually saw these. They measured how these animals walk. And I thought that was kind of cool to, like probe exactly how that works and why it works the way it does um, in addition to some background stuff on it so I'm actually going to set up a poll for a few minutes and tell you all exactly the options um, so we have centipedes and these are giant centipedes to start off the science we also have um, gyanomorphs gynanomorphs. I the spelling folks spelling Balin's spelling is terrible on these Gyandromorph. Oh my goodness. Gyandromorphs are an option for tonight. Uh, we've got some about fungus. We have some about embryos. That's kind of like, what are some of the things that I had lined up for tonight? Uh, what are gyandromorphs? So, Becca, these are creatures that you may have seen outside, and you may have thought these are weird colored creatures. <clears throat> and you might not have left it at that. They are animals. Usually the ones that survive have a very distinct feature where half their body is male and the other half of their body is female. And it's a, it's a result of... Um, like, it's a developmental. It's a developmental result. Hi, Grimly! Grimly, can we see the smiling monkey? Grimly, can we see the smiling monkey, my friend? Grimly, I got to see you today, sir, over the Streamscribe stream. And thank you, Grimly. <laughs> there it is. Um, and it is so much fun to see Grimly. They are not hermaphrodites, Mike. So in biological terms, hermaphrodites can't have male and reproductive sex organs, but they can reproduce on their own. So it's a, like our nematodes, Ellie elegans, right? Ellie, the C. elegans, or the nematode, has both male and female reproductive organs, and she can self-fertilize. Hi, Alex! <laughs> Alex, I don't know. I don't know why I started gobbling, but that's where we went. That's where we went, Alex. How you doing, Alex? Lady Lara Croft is in the his house. How you doing, Lady Lara Croft? It's great to see you, Lady Lara Croft. Um, like the ant. Yes, the previous ant that I'd posted, Gwen, and I found this. Um, there is an insect meme channel that I'm part of on Facebook. I know y'all, Facebook, what are you talking about? But it had an image that was going viral. And that was, to me, I was like, huh, that's actually a really interesting bit of something science that we've maybe tangentially talked about before, but like not really any heavily. So I thought, you know, maybe we can look into it 
and talk about some of these creatures and their biology behind them. If y'all wanted to, that's one possible option. Thank you, Miss Sprints, Alex Dixon. Thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, so, Gwen, what is it? The meme channel, it's something... It's a really strange channel title, Gwen. It's like... Entomemology? Something like that? Entomemology? It's like a very convoluted, twisted name for it, Gwen. Um, the other topics for tonight, folks, if y'all want to go ahead and vote, um, there's a particular kind of decaying fungus that we can chat about. There's also a new one on embryo embryology, like mouse embryology, if y'all are interested Hello in. There. Hi, music girl! Hello there. Hello there. I've just been being silly. Nibbles of the Alex, what is your favorite kind of thing? Centipede? Don't die. So in particular, let me hold on. Let me, ah, my image pull. There we go. Trying to pull over your tabs is very, very difficult. Chat, what we're going to be talking about tonight. What are we going to be talking about tonight? Let me quickly. I just need it. I need my image. I need my image to introduce. It's gonna be a little bit of physicsy stuff. The vi the videos are the coolest things I think on this particular creature. Um, we will talk about venomics on this, as well as um, locomotion movement and how exactly this was all done in terms of like behavior on this animal. So this is the one we're chatting about tonight. Um, this is actually the giant centipede. Um, this is what the redemption was for. Oh, yes, there was a poll going on, and we do have a... Thank you, Smikes. Thank you, Smikes. Smikes is on point. We do have a YouTube channel, folks, run by the lovely and amazing Debs Chat. Actually, we had a new video uploaded tonight um, on the grab bag science that we do. Yay! A great for monkey hair product. Really? I had no idea. I had absolutely no idea, Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland, how are you doing? Um, Cliff's favorite paper... Cliff, it says bad request, Cliff Alistair McLean. Cliff, it says bad request, Cliff Alistair McLean. Um, we do have a YouTube page. It's um, run by the lovely and amazing Debs. Debs has been hard at work trimming down, trimming out the fat, if you will, of the, the random science stuff that we have. Um, so she trims down the intros and the outros. She puts um, some nice headers on there and it just looks absolutely lovely. So Chad, if you're not already checking out the amazing... Debs, number one. And then also the YouTube page. Please check it out. Um, because of the comma. There's five. Pages. What comma? Five Kevins. When there is a new sound alert tonight, and there is also a new, um, I'm just going to copy and paste it from Alex. When there's a new sound alert and a new, uh, animation tonight. It was, yeah, it's, it broke again, Alex. It broke again with the comma. Land without stars? Oh, wow, there is a centipede there. Cliff, this seems... like it could be really sad. It seems like a post-apocalyptic era story. Some monkeys will antagonize centipedes and then rub the venom on their head. Oh, gotcha. I gotcha, Alice. Sorry. Alice, I thought you meant... Like, you know how sometimes some humans also will have extract of berries and raspberries and blueberries and mix that in with their shampoo and, like, all that jazz? I thought that's where you were going with that. It's a little bit... It's a, it's slightly different. It is slightly different. But I, I do appreciate you. Um, yes, so centipedes are used for... Uh, the quite, So, Alice, some things that have been talked about with that is if it's... If it's self-medication because it's prophylactic because they're using it to prevent things ahead of time and also if it's social learning or not thank you alex i i, I just copied and pasted it alex but i appreciate you i copied and pasted your full link with the commas and then it came over i assume it's the same thing yeah it's the same thing um so post apocalyptic in certain sense like all of see i haven't i haven't seen the um I haven't read those comics. I haven't read those comics. Guys, 
Alex, you are far too kind, madame. Thank you, Alex Erickson. What is the animation? Uh, Gwen, you know that the, you type exclamation point sounds and exclamation point gifts to see the new things. You said you have a new sound that I find really funny, and then you have um, a new animation to play with as well. Hi, Tactics. How you doing, Tactics? Um, the one thing I do remember about the monkey study is that it's been hypothesize whether or not those monkeys that are rubbing the centipedes on their bodies are doing social learning or if they're doing um, mimicry. And I know you might be like, why does this matter? It's, it's a definition war that people get in about if, mim if, social if mimicry is social learning and vice versa. And they just, because of how complicated the social structures are, they're not able to like really test that in a lab setting. For my ally is the force. Uh, well, so Alice, they may understand why they're doing it, but the question is the ones that watch the experienced individuals, if they watch the experienced individuals, do they do it because, so do they do it themselves because they're watching and mimicking the behavior and learning that that's what they should be doing? Like you're saying, like maybe they don't fully understand. Or if there is information exchange, like the experienced ones, it's like, hey, if you do this, it will be protective uh, for you for some reason, right? Like those are the the two hypotheses and it's very, very difficult to tease, tease apart. Uh, Gwen, we do have a Morbin time. Gwen, just type exclamation point Morbin. And it's, it's a very zesty sound alert, Gwendolyn P. It's a very zesty sound alert, Gwendolyn P. No, thank you. I love you, Gwen. Um, so again, which centipede are we chatting about today? So I will post the full name of it. It is the giant centipede. It is. It's there, Gwen. It's there, Gwen. Those are the sounds. So Gwen, you won't have an animation with that. But there is a new sound there. It's near the end, Gwen. And then the gifts. I'll give you a hint, Gwen. It was we were working on it yesterday. We worked on it yesterday, Gwen. And now we have it animated for you, Gwen. So that is the giants of the beat. I like your pants around your pants. Thanks, Mikes. Pants around your pants. I thought it was hilarious. And so we have pants around your pants. It's very, very funny to me. It's very funny. It makes absolutely no sense. And it just, I had me chuckling for about 30 minutes. I'm like, you know what? That's the sound that's going in. Makes no sense at all, but we're good with it. We're good with it. Uh, mimicry versus communication. That is... An important distinction it's like the difference between breaking a branch up to make a tool or finding a toy that satisfied the same function yeah and alice the reason i know that this is a, a, a thing like a hot topic in the field is because it's been the same issue in um in fruit flies so in fruit flies alice they have this exact same debate happening and we actually had um this asked of one of our publications they were like how do we, how do we know or how do you know that it's um mimicry versus a learned behavior and what we ended up doing was learning if you change the fly's behavior so they couldn't do the behavior anymore but they could still confer the information then the students still learned and so there was that made it was social learning instead of that actually being some kind of um just straight mimicry, yeah. Uh, Gwen, you're close, Gwen. You're close, Gwen. You're close, Gwendolyn P. You're very close, Gwendolyn P. You're very, very close, Gwendolyn P. It is intriguing, Alice, and it's, there's been a lot of animals it's been studied with. Meerkats, all the way to fruit flies, even uh, worms have been studied on that front as well, which I think is really cool. Um, so a couple of quick facts about these animals. Yeah, you're close. Giant tree, giant tree, giant tree. Let's go. Thank you, Gwendolyn B. Thank you, Gwendolyn B. Door? Smikes, I don't yet have a command about door. But I'm glad, glad Gwen liked the new command. I'm glad you liked it, Gwen. Prove you wrong. You just hit door, Smikes. You just hit door. Can the information be inherited at all? Ooh, Octavius coming in with a hard hit question. Guys, go check out 
got the legendary amazing Dr. Amy, that's number one. Number two. So in some cases, Octavius, there can be information exchange down the generations. So Octavius, Lita actually had a paper. Hold on. It's okay, Gwen! Chat, really quickly, let's set up a prediction for the lovely and amazing Gwen P of how many science topics will get discussed tonight. There we go. So there is this effect, Octavius, called transgenerational inheritance. Um, essentially, Octavius, what that means is there are effects that happen after an exposure. So instead of giving the information to your next generation through experiences or like a teaching, essentially, instead of teaching what you do instead, there is genetic information passed on. So one way that we can do this is this is one of Lita's studies. So this is figure one of the paper, Octavius. So Octavius, what you have here is that the fruit flies undergo a threat and they're undergoing a threat from parasitic wasps. What they end up doing to this parasitic wasp, there we go, uh, their behavior changes, they lay fewer eggs and they prefer to lay their eggs on ethanol covered food. Uh, it's World Microscope Day, I had no idea, Smike. So, Smike, some of these days, I never, I never know about these days, Smikes. Like, there's World Peanut Butter Day. I love peanut butter. But I'm not going to know when World Peanut Butter Day is. Again, not because I could, not because I don't want to. It's just, it just that's what it comes to. Um, so, Octavius, what will happen here is the flies will either prefer to lay on ethanol-laden food if they've seen the stressor, or they will not lay on ethanol-laden food. They'll just lay on regular food for it. Um, and the regular food just consists of 0% ethanol. Uh, maybe we should play a birthday song for the microscopes. Maybe Smikes. Possibly, potentially, but maybe, possibly. So what happens, Octavius, is this information can be passed between individuals that are exposed. But what's really interesting is what you're asking is that the next generation inherits the behavior. Yes. So, Alice, there is a genetic predisposition. The adult fruit flies... Um, will change their behavior. They will change their behavior uh, based on an exposure to these to these parasitic wasps. Even though they've never seen Alice the wasps before, they will change their behavior. Hi, Detector. Welcome in. They change their behavior because that threat is a threat not to themselves. The adults are under no threat. Only their offspring are. So they are changing their behavior to protect their babies. And so it's, it gets even cooler, Octavius, to me, is that the next generation, so these babies, so normally, let me show you, Octavius. Can I zoom in further? Okay, normally, do you see these this blue bar, Octavius? Anchored, high anchored. Chad, go check out the amazing anchored albatross. Go check out the amazing, birthday anchored albatross, anchored. Would burner extraordinaire. We love you, Anchored. So, chat. This right, the blue bar right here is the percentage of eggs that the flies usually lay when they are not exposed. Or if I zoom into this graph here, right here, you see normally there are 20% of their eggs are laid, are laid on alcohol. Which is very different from when the red bar, which is when you expose them. That's when they... Are, they have seen the wasps, and even after you remove the wasp, they will lay, continue laying their eggs on that ethanol-laden food to protect, to protect their embryos. Now, Octavius, again, where it gets crazy is you see these lighter red bars. So the dark red bars are flies that have seen the wasps. The light red bars are flies that have never before seen a wasp, but they are from mothers 
and grandmothers and great grandmothers and great great grandmothers that have seen wasps and that is inherited that behavior and is inherited across multiple generations in fact if you look across this lower bar that's the generation time f1 is like the next generation f2 is second generation so on and so forth what you'll see is up till the sixth generation the exposed babies behave differently and it eventually decays now it's wild octavius is this same thing has been shown in fruit flies uh not fruit flies sorry worms it's also five generations at a decaying rate something there's something magical about the number five hi v welcome in v and also chat happy jefferson thomas jefferson day inventor of the jefferson tuba cliff alistair mcclain thank you for that reminder of the jefferson tuba day cliff alistair mcclain you breathtaking soul v how are you doing today and hello mayo welcome on in mayo chat if you're not checking out the amazing some guy named v the game is v uh wants all the people to follow the world in the world him uh v uh seven eighths of the world's population i think it's the offline hype trains gaming extraordinaire and uh your local shy boy we love you v we love you v very much um darwinism that prevents yes yeah, so how is it inherited is what uh, octavius was asking so octavius there is a really cool video that i think you might enjoy let's this is from the leader of the field His name is Oded Rakavi, and he is number one sign. Hi, Jimmy B. Got any grapes? Mr. B. How you doing, Mr. B? Welcome on in, Mr. B. Jimmy, how are you doing today? Nerdy Nods, hello, hello. Welcome on in, everyone. I hope you're all having an amazing evening. We are already starting off on a different topic. We are talking about transgenerational inheritance of behavior, meaning inheritance of behavior across generations which i think is quite gnarly octavius was asking folks how this happens we've officially relocated nerdy knots did you get your items before you relocated just double triple quadruple checking mayo thank you for the lurk mayo um so octavius there is a chromosomal trick that you can do hi dmx uh, our family's made it to Georgia, and boy, we have some AM videos for you. I hope, I hope they're, uh, you left the stickers behind? Octavius, Octavius was asking how exactly this inheritance of behavior happens. So, Octavius, what what we actually did was first you have to you have to identify potential molecules that could be changed, and what we found to be changing was this molecule called neuropeptide F, and the amount of neuropeptide F was changing across these generations. So, neuropeptide F is in insects. But humans have an equivalent called neuropeptide Y. Neuropeptide Y is a, uh, a neuropeptide that's involved in addiction behavior. So actually, it's been shown that in like alcoholism, your NPY levels vary. They actually go down when you become addicted to alcohol. And so, interestingly enough, when fruit flies are exposed to parasitic wasps, they lower the uh, the amount of npf is is lowered very similar to how humans do chat speaking about how humans do if you're not already checking out the amazing breathtaking jimmy b 93 please go follow the amazing breathtaking jimmy b 93 jimmy leader of the concert hall breathtaking music streamer song, singer streamer gamer extraordinaire we love you mr jimmy b 93 most all right for the most part today was a bit chaotic but glad tomorrow is friday why was it chaotic jimmy doing all right today i'm doing all right it was a, good, a little crazy time for us too but I am also. I did not think today was Thursday. I thought Monday was Sunday. I thought Tuesday was Monday. I thought Wednesday was Monday. I thought today was Tuesday. It's been a weird week, Jimmy. 
Hi, Maddie Holmes. Welcome in. Why is it neuropeptide F? So it's structurally different spikes, but it does the same thing. This tends to happen a lot when you transfer from animal to human. There might be additional loops in the protein structure, so they might have a few other functions in the in the more advanced quote unquote system. Like in the mammalian system, you might have an additional feature of the protein, and the the neuropeptide makes it do something a little bit different, but also like it might have multiple jobs instead of just one. So that's why there's a couple of features. Hi, pattern juggler. Well, come on in, pattern. So that's why it's called something different. So Octavius, what's cool is we can you can measure the levels of these neuropeptides. And so th do you see the sad face here, Octavius? This frowny purple that's labeled FSB. So the FSB is the fan-shaped body, and that is the center of the fruit fly brain that is responsible for visual learning and memory. The wasp exposure is visual, and they remember and learn the behavior. So all, it makes it makes sense that that's the region of the brain that would be involved. Now, if you measure the amount of neuropeptide F in that, what we're talking about right now, Hello readers. There. Hi, Crafty Story. Is um, the ability of organisms to inherit behavior across generations. So what we were talking about was there's a fruit fly that does a behavior. And the next generation will do the same behavior, even though it has not received the original exposure from the, the parent. So the parent changes its behavior because of a threat. The next generation has never seen that threat before. And yet, they are changing their behavior. And then the following generation maintains that behavioral change as well. Um, I'm not sure, Graf, though. It's okay. Hi, suitable substrate. And sister blue luck, come on in. And so, one thing that we were able to measure is the question of how exactly this works. Kind of the grandmother hypothesis. Uh, so, a little, Maddie. For this, I mean, it, it's dif difficult um, because, it, you know, it's not just grandmother. So, it might be a misnomer. It goes for, like, five five generations at least so the the offspring v the children and the children's children and the children's children's children do not ever see the threat but they behave as if they had there is a mammalian example yes well, we'll get to it so in the fruit fly you can actually measure octavius this level of this neuropeptide called neuropeptide f neuropeptide wine humans and you can show it goes down in exposed and the next generation in red see how the red and the pink are lower than the blue that's how it, it's showing that it's maintained it stays down and that's what's driving the behavior and it turns out you can even figure out what chromosome this is happening with um lita did a neat genetic trick uh, hi, Andrew ZZ. You have not, but hello, Andrew ZZ. Chad, if you're not checking out the breathtaking, amazing Andrew ZZ, you're not doing life right. Workout streamer, tech streamer extraordinaire. We love Andrew ZZ. So very much, Chad. Go check out the amazing Andrew ZZ. Chad. Let me, Andrew. If subsequent generations are exposed to the threat, does the degradation in that neuropeptide not happen? So if they are Be exposed... Be excellent to each other. Really is. If they are exposed, Octavius, it's additive, meaning that the effect that you see is even stronger. So it's it, it gets even like, it, it's like a feedback loop. If you don't see the threat, it eventually starts decaying away each generation. However, if you do see the threat, it starts boop, bailing back up and up and up and up. So it's a reinforcement mechanism. Uh, yes, you can blind them, Alice. So you can do, um, there are genetic mutants of fruit flies called Nina B. Uh, Nina B is a photoreceptor that's critical for sight. You can get rid of that photoreceptor and the animals can no longer see. They have normal eyes, structurally, but they cannot see. Indeed, Maddie Holmes, indeed. Uh, uh, but it's more of an environmental change creating massive change in subsequent generations that, um, that might into necessarily, not necessarily, they, there is, well, so it depends what you mean by a genetic component, Maddie. It is still based in the DNA, but it is not a result of mutation. So Octavius, there is no mutation that takes place. Instead of what's happening, you are changing the structure of the DNA to make certain genes more or less accessible. In this case, the NPF gene, the neuropeptide F gene, was made more accessible, 
which means, uh, or sorry, made less accessible, meaning less of it could be produced, meaning the behavior happened. That makes sense, uh, Octavia. So less neuropeptide F, more of this um, alcohol seeking behavior. And each gener and what Lito was able to show is that there's this really cool uh, chromosome fusion trick uh, where you can actually fuse chromosomes. Hello again, Supernatural Writer. Hello there. Chad, if you're not checking out the legendary Supernatural Writer, please go check out the amazing Supernatural Writer. Workout streamer, co-working streamer, extraordinaire! Hello, Supernatural Writer. I hope you're doing well tonight. Um, so Octavius, what you can do is this neat genetic trick called chromosome fusions. The chromosome fusions mean that you fuse chromosome three together. So you have two chromosomes, you know, usually you have chrom mom gives one chromosome to the offspring. Dad gives one chromosome to the offspring, right? So that's, what you, that's how we are formed. We have a mix of chromosomes from our, our parents. With chromosome fusions, what you can do is see in this little image here, this is the second chromosome and this is the third chromosome. And you've tied them together in a knot. So that if there is an embryo that only gets mom's chromosomes, like from this match, that means she'll that embryo is only inheriting chromosomes and genetic information from mom. Same thing with dad. You can do a chromosome fusion. So the only viable embryo is one that only has this lone pair. So it's only a lone pair from dad or a lone pair from mom. If an embryo gets both pairs, so a total of four chromosomes, it's lethal to the embryo, so it dies. If they get no copies, it's lethal to the embryo and it dies. So this is not a normally occurring effect. This is a special uh, genetic trick that you can do. These fly lines are made in a lab to fuse together the chromosomes, um, allowing you to do this kind of feature. So what the goal of this was, Octavius, is number one, to figure out, okay, we know that it's based on this one experiment here. We know it's not based on dad. So you can expose the fathers only, let them mate with females, and then test the offspring, and it turns out those offspring don't inherit the behavior. So dad does not pass on the genetic information of that predator, of that the alcoholism, right, in this case, to the next generation. Instead, it's only mom. So what you would predict, there's a great control in this experiment. In this experiment, if you test embryos with this paternal fusion, because it's from the dad, they should not have the behavior at all. If they get it from mom, they should have the behavior. And that's what you see. So you figure out what chromosome is important. Turns out it's chromosome two in this case. You can then do chromosomal knockouts. So Octavius, this is a really, really cool, again, genetic trick. There are regions of the chromosome that you can utilize that have these gaps. So you have a gap here and a gap here and a gap here. So you see that light blue? The dark blue is what the gene, sh nor the chromosome should normally look like. This dark blue one right here. Above it is the light blue and there's a gap. So that gap is me showing and demonstrating that there are genes missing. So essentially what has happened is a region of the chromosome has been removed. And so you can then test, okay, if I remove that, I know that chromosome two is important. What if I start removing sections of chromosome two? Well, they still have the behavior. And it turned out if you removed certain regions of chromosome two, they don't have the behavior anymore. And so what actually is cool, Octavius, you see that this one right here, I'll zoom in a little bit further. This uh, one here, do you see this one has a small gene missing? And this one has a larger gene missing, but it also has the exact same gene above it that's missing. So it's there's an overlap, right? So you would predict, Octavius, that if this upper one was the answer, if you if you get rid of this gene here and it gets rid of the behavior, then you would suspect that this would also work. 
and that's sure enough what happens and what you actually find is that this neuropeptide f gene is actually that's where the start side of it is that's where that gene starts and what that means is that part of the gene is modified in some way on that chromosome presumably it makes it becomes less accessible in those animals that have undergone an exposure octavius stop me if this doesn't make any sense the same goes for the rest of chat if this does not make any sense please let me know and i will re-explain it but basically you can figure out what chromosome it's on and even what gene it is on which i think is really cool gucci gucci andrew sir you are gucci how about you are gucci and amazing and breathtaking and we love your face makes sense cool awesome awesome so octavius you can do this for other organisms as well as just identifying what that stimulus is for example yes and, and and smike says if you or anyone is not comfortable asking a question or saying that i'm not following let a mod know and let's just shoot them a dm like hey i just really want to ask this question but i just i'm just uncomfortable asking please could you ask it and then a mod will ask the question and not reveal who you are they will just post the question in the chat and we'll answer it as such so i want you all to make sure you're comfortable asking questions here worst case scenario i don't know what the answer is and it's one where i'm like i so far don't know the answer that we we will look it up later off stream together because i want to filter through and make sure everything is um is appropriate because if i have no idea about it then i don't want to like go off half cocked and find stuff online because it's it could very well be bad right thank you andrew cc um thank you pattern very kind so octavius this has been shown in mice and it's been shown in, in nematodes nematodes are that the c elegans that is the um this character that we have if you do exclamation point shock victory screech they have also been shown to have this so actually let's octavius go to the appropriate video to dissect some of the science behind it hello specter flight how are you doing specter flight welcome in specter flight so this octavius this gentleman's name is oded rakavi and one my my dream one day octavius is to have him on the stream this man is a revolutionary he works at um a university in israel i forget now which tel, uh, tel aviv university and he is a brilliant brilliant mind on this, this exact question that you were asking about next generational inheritance so let's watch him talk about it and then we'll go into the mammalian side of things as well um a alice we rabbit hole a lot um just like we should all follow specter flight chat specter flight has had a not so ideal day be a snoop dog in the his house boys hello boys because how you doing boys chat specter has not yet had a not or less than ideal day and you know what makes people feel better some follows folks please go follow loving amazing specter flight Spectre, I love your face. I'm sorry you had a rough day. If there's anything we can do to make you smile a little bit more and, you know, chuckle and have a good time, let me know, Spectre, and we'll do. Boyds, welcome on in. Boyds, we... So we're already rabbit-holing Boyds. But our amazing friend Octavius was asking about the biology behind inheritance of behavior. Not in terms of normal inheritance like so boys for example you know how horses spook at the side of a movement of a snake that is an inheritance of genetic behavior across generations of a this does count this one does Gwen, because this is like not just a, a, a silly rabbit hole we're going full force on this one um so that's normally inherited it's like you and i you and i are naturally this natural disposition to be born and afraid of snakes but there are animals and organisms that have a cross-generational inheritance of behavior that's a function of an initial exposure. So the one we started chatting about, Boyds, is uh, fruit flies get exposed to parasitic wasps and they change their behavior accordingly. So they change their behavior, they change their behavior 
to protect their offspring and their offspring's offspring and the offspring's offspring. So the babies that never see the predator threat before have this behavior that you normally only would have if you're exposed to the threat. And it's maintained for five generations. And if you look across generations, it eventually fades. And so we were able to figure out, okay, it, it turns out it's a gene that's modified on a particular chromosome, which is quite remarkable as something like that happens. And so there's other animals that do this too, boys. The expert in the field, his name is Oded Bukavi. We're gonna watch a video by him where he explains kind of the biology behind in worms, how this works. And uh, then there's also a mammalian example that we'll pull up. The mammalian one is more controversial um, because it's mammals, but it's illustrating the same principle. So, boys, it's, it's it's genes don't change in so far as the sequence, but instead the accessibility changes. So, so this behavior that we were chatting about is a decrease of a certain protein, and the decrease of that protein it seems like as a result of that region of the genome tightens up and it becomes less accessible. And because it's less accessible, you can't make the DNA to RNA to protein leap because you can't ever make the RNA because it's it's that region of the genome is tightly wind up, wound up. And so it's a way of genetic regulation. And then so it's it lasts a few generations and you can you can imagine it's a quick way to respond to a predator or any kind of threat where it's a not a permanent change in your genome because presumably the predator threat or whatever it's threatening you is not permanent either. It's just a transient thing that's happening. Um, hi, Winsing. Welcome in, Winsing. It's five, it, it's, no, Gwen? Five, it seems like, it's not, cause, so there's no, okay, Gwen, I'm so sorry. Gwen LMP, there hasn't been enough, this enough shown in enough, um model organism enough organisms and enough situations to have a rule of thumb yet so it do, i think it's probably more than coincidence because the smikes points out the planarians also have this five generational memory time the worms have five generational time the wor the flies have five generational time the mice haven't been studied across that many generations so we don't know but then like when it's this is like that weird debate how many how many generations do you need to see for the behavior to be set like and for, for you to be convinced that it's a rule of thumb I don't have the answer for you, Gwen, but I think it's an interesting like hypothesis. Guys, speaking of also interesting, please go follow our friend Boyd's Custom Fab, amazing woodcrafter extraordinaire. Boyd's, I love your face so very much. I hope you and Wicked Walnut are having a great evening. Great stream earlier today. Any day that I get to see you always makes me smile. Um, you do so much for everyone. Just thank you for being you, seriously. Guys, go check out Boyd's, please and thank you. Um, so let's watch this video from Oded Rukavi. I I'm going to take the jump and reach out to this gentleman. I would love to have him on the stream. I think y'all would really, really enjoy it. He is a great speaker. So, a little personal background of him. He put on a conference at Tel Aviv University a few years ago, before COVID hit. And it was called... It was called something wild. It was like the conference to end all conferences okay and the way he set it up i i love how this man set it up you were not allowed to talk about anything that was published because a lot of times scientists get very squirrely and afraid to pub to talk about unpublished data because they're worried someone's going to steal their work and if someone steals their work it means that they they don't get the recognition and then they won't get the grant and then their career is in the tank it sounds crazy it happens so his first rule nothing that was already published number two you had 10 minutes number three you needed a theme song that you walked up to on stage Janie Flippin' Sue, that's who, that's who, that's who, Janie Flippin' Sue. 
Hello, Janie Flippin' How you doing, Janie Flippin' Zoo? Chad, Janie Flippin' an amazing artist and gamer. Extraordinary member of the Mocha Loco stream team. Chad, make sure to follow the one and the only legendary. Breathtaking. Janie Flippin' Zoo! Janie, I love your raid call and I love your face, ma'am. I hope you're doing well. Y'all, the amazing art that Janie does, like the mugs, and it's just, it is next level. Please go follow Janie Flippin' Zoo. She's a absolute riot. First person shooters, art. Always a good time. Check out Janie Flippin' Zoo. I did. I won the shot glass. Janie, I'm so excited. That was the one thing that I won. Is I won a Janie Flippin' Zoo piece. And I'm so very excited. No, no, no. I'm not worried. No, no, no. You don't have to. I, it's, if you do that, then we need to chat offline. Because that's that's that doesn't seem appropriate, Janie. I will not be taking advantage of your kindness. I am not that kind of person. We can talk offline, Janie Flippin' Zoo. Because I... The worst thing on earth is if, if to take advantage of someone's kindness. And it's, oh my god, it's done. We will, we will, we, Janie, we will talk about this. We will talk about this, ma'am, okay? Don't you dare. Don't you dare. I take advantage. I, look, Janie, I. There are so many artists, and there are so. It's, look, we all try to make it, right? And it's just, it's, I, look, I want to give away our stuff. Right, I enjoy giving like people our stuff, and it's also like, well, Bullet, eventually you have to make some coin on it too, and that's the same thing. That's why, Janie, if, if you're if you're gonna do that, that is fine, but we're gonna we're gonna have to chat, because I can't I cannot have that be just the full thing. I, but I'm a fan of you, Janie. So chat, please, please tell Janie that her work is beautiful. I'm guarantee you it's underpriced. And I want to make sure that she knows that she is loved and appreciated. Janie, we will talk about this. And if you refuse to talk about this, then I'll just sub-bomb you. It's fine. Uh, it's okay. He still calls me out despite my clarification. And the gar garlic compound, Alicia, twice. I don't mind. I am so sorry, Alicia. Is it Alicia? I am the when I I'll Alishan is that not right? Alishan like Allison. Can I just say Allison? Can I say Allison? I am so sorry. I know you clear. This is the problem, Allison. I get the names in my head, and if I'm not corrected right away. A few times I it gets stuck in my head and like there was someone who I called Ubi for six months until I noticed the underscore was after the B so he was really UB iWorks not Ubi iWorks six months before I noticed And that is going to continue, Smikes. That is 100% going to continue. That is a that is a beautiful, precious memory between me and Kodali. Chat. So, Ode Rikavi. Uh, by the way, uh, what Janie Flippin' Sue is talking about, that uh, Janie and I are the same stream team. Uh, they are run, it is run by Derek and Devin of Moco Made. We are extremely proud to be Moco Locos here on the channel, as you can see. Boop, front and center. There it is. Is it not supposed to be Smikes? Wouldn't surprise me. Um, guys, go follow Jared. Go follow Derek and Devin. I love those two so very much. They have introduced us to an amazing community. Um, and everyone that on that stream team is 100% someone that should be followed. Guys, go check out that stream. Go check out the stream team. Seriously. You're Smikes, look, you could be teasing. Smicky. <laughs> exactly. It's, 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 it's Smikiza. Smikiza. Look, I'm on the Smikiza. 24. Right. Apparently, Smikes is Italian now. Smikiza. All right. So, Octavius, to get back to your question, Oded Rikami. Um, again, Tel Aviv University. So, he put on this conference. It's a conference, end all conferences. You can only talk about unpublished data, and you have to walk up on stage with a theme song playing. It was like WWE style theme song coming in, like. It was, it was absolute madness of a conference. Together, we can rule the galaxy. Janie, thank you for that tier one sub, ma'am. 
Janie, thank you for that resub. Madame, please enjoy the ad-free viewing. The emotes made with love. And remember, you have access to all of these sounds, Janie. And all of these gifts. Janie, please call us chaos. Please call us chaos. Janie, for example, if you want to just make silly sounds about pants, you now can. I like your pants around your pants. Do that. Saying I have something going to use an email. Uh, Janie, please, there is never any pressure to sub. Uh, there is never any pressure to get bits. There is never any pressure for anything. I am grateful to have you here even to stop in, say hello, go right into lurk mode or close the laptop and not come back for the rest of the evening. You taking any moment of your day to say hello, that's a big deal. And I really, really appreciate it. That goes for everyone. I need... But Janie, there is no pressure on that. There is no pressure. Janie will be giving three new emotes. I'm going to be switching them out for um, May. So May will have three seasonal emotes of Star Wars. And we'll have, uh, because we're doing themed months. We're doing Star Wars for May, for Sci Art Sunday, Marvel for June, and DC for July. And afterwards, we have more coming, but those are the set ones already. Uh, and then also, Jane, you can type exclamation point mocos, and you can show off your team, stream team pride. Who let the ants out? Let's go! So. It's, it's a critical Janie flipping suit. It's critical. So, Octavius, let's let's learn a little bit from Odette. I, I do know him. He's a big deal on Twitter. Uh, and so I wonder if I reach out to him, maybe he'll consider coming on the stream and talking to us about this research because that would be really, really cool. And then y'all can ask questions too. Memories shouldn't, shouldn't be inherited. We know this intuitively, also from, from our experience. So, so for example, if you read a book, you know that um, your kids won't know its content. Or if you go to the gym, you know that your kids won't become stronger as a result. This is obvious. And acquired traits should not be inherited. But nevertheless, many scientists over the, year, the years tried to, to examine whether nevertheless our experiences in life do affect the biology of our children. And I'll tell you very briefly the sad history of this field, which is filled with controversies and, and, um, and all kinds of crazy stories. So about 100 years ago, a scientist named Paul Kammerer, who was very famous at the time, was working here in Vienna, was studying uh, a toad that is called the midwife toad, because the males carry the eggs. And he used this, this, this toad as an, in an attempt to show that acquired traits and memories can transfer to the next generation. These, there are two types of toads that Kammerer studies. One that lives on land and one that lives underwater. And they are different in terms of their appearance and also abilities. He claimed that he can take the toad that normally lives on land and train it by changing the uh, cultivation conditions for a few generations until it becomes, it evolves to become a toad that lives underwater. And when it did so, it also changed its appearance, and he claimed that it grew these black nuptial pads, these structures on the hands that, for uh, toads that live underwater, help the male grab the female without sleeping. So that right there would normally be unheard of, right? If you heard that, that if you trained an animal to live in the water and then it acquired these traits of like having these webbed feet, you'd be like, no, that's that's not a thing that should not happen that's that we've we've learned that since biology and seventh grade or whatever that that shouldn't happen right this was an amazing exper um, uh, discovery which questions lots of what we know about how evolution and biology works however his story um, ended sadly because he was accused of cheating he was accused of injecting ink to the hands of the toads, and he, and he couldn't handle the accusation, and, and he killed himself. Then, later in the 60s and 70s in the US, a, a very different character, James McConnell, uh, tried... Jamie, it gets, it gets, it gets... Do you remember the Unabomber, Jamie, the Unabomber? ...to do even wilder experiments to prove that memory can be inherited. He was studying a, 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 
worm that is called Planaria, which is the champion of regeneration. So if you cut off the, uh, the Planaria's head, it grows a new head after a few days, about a week, including the brain and everything. And he claimed that he can teach this Planaria certain things, certain memories, and then chop off its head, and the new head that will grow will still contain the memories that the previous generation acquired. He did even wilder things. These Planaria are also cannibals, so they eat each other. So he fed naive worms with worms that he taught certain things, and he claimed that the memory transferred by digestion. So this was very wild. Many people didn't believe him, but that was the least of his concerns, because he received a, a bomb from the terrorist known as the Unabomber. <laughs> so the Unabomber, <laughs> Janie, targeted this man as well. So there is, this has been a near cursed field of research, this transgenderal inheritance of behavior. Anywhere, like, there, it goes against what we've defined as what behavior and evolution should be. Um, because we've always, like, there's, like, Lamarck is always, Hi, Crystal! Lamarckism is like, that's wrong. There's no inheritance of acquired traits. You're done. And so anyone who shows anything, even with good science, it seems to, like, make a bad fate. And unfortunately, what happens to Paul Kammer? Camera, um, that is actually much more common than what you would think. Unfortunately, y'all know about Twitter bullies, right? Um, unfortunately, scientists are not any better, and scientists will gang up on Twitter against young scientists, and you've seen like suicides happen because of um, of science deemed controversial by some people, where it shouldn't be. I have a good thing to learn. Which is really frustrating, but unfortunately, that's that's just how the, the field still is. I mean, so it's controversial, Octavius, because the field has defined that this does not happen. And so the field says there is no inheritance of acquired traits. And so the moment you start showing data that says that, well, clearly you're lying. Clearly you're making this up because we've decided that this doesn't happen. Hello, Farg! Welcome in, Farg. Welcome on in. Welcome in, Varg. How you doing, Varganaut? Um, so Octavius, is, it's unfortunate, but this isn't just for um for this particular one. Like, it's not just for this one behavior and what like on feature. It's for any kind of science that's cutting edge. Let's continue on for a little bit. Well, let me find the worm part. And this is how I started working on the, on this topic. So that's Oded saying, like, how, how is it going to end for me? That's how he said. The, thank you. The difference was that I decided to study this using a, a simpler worm that is called C. elegans, which is a very important model for biology studying genetic sense. Which, by the way, there is an emote of the, the, uh, the shocked Ellie. Uh, if y'all would like to carry across the streams, there's shocked Ellie for you right there. So you can you can use an emotode that carries memory the information across many generations across streams on Twitch. It's a very weird thing to say. It's cool nonetheless. And neurobiology. And uh, so after I finished my PhD, I went to New York to study this with Oliver Hobart, a famous neurobiologist in Columbia University. And uh, and I'm still in love with this worm. I still study it today, almost a decade after. It's a, it's a great model for many things, especially for studying inheritance, genetics, and neurobiology. The reason that it's just such a good model is that, first of all, it reproduces very fast. The generation time is very fast. So you have a new generation every three days, so you can study many generations fast. Second, uh, every, every mother produces something like 250 babies. So we have large numbers and good statistics. And the third thing is that its, its brain are, is extremely simple. So it has just 300 neurons in the brain, 300 brain cells. Which is a lot fewer than the fruit fly we were just chatting about. Those fruit flies that we were looking at have anywhere from like roughly 80 to 100,000 cells in their brains. So it's, it's still far simpler than the millions that we have in the human brain. 
but so you know going simpler to figure out a phenomena before you go up in complexity just like folks if you want to see the complexity of the night sky you should go check out the amazing astronomy show astronomy show how are you doing tonight welcome on an astronomy show we have many billions so it's much much more complex and uh, but, but before i tell you what i discovered using using this worm uh, I, you need to understand why in theory memories should not be inherited the reason there are a few reasons the main reason is that we have two types of cells in our body somatic cells which are the regular cells of the body like uh, blood cells and allison i think the flat earther would tell you that, that, that maybe depth is also fake because be speaking of which when it's flat earth is it that the earth is thin like a sheet of paper or is it still thick like a pizza but it's just it's just flat and is there anyone on the other side of it i they have so many questions that don't make sense it doesn't matter folks it doesn't matter it's turtles all the way down it's like an avatar i'm fine with that one it could be a, we could be on the back of a giant turtle i can do that it's just it's it's the thinness of the earth that gets me it's on the back of a giant turtle on top of four elephants that's also fine i love elephants i also really like turtles so it's yeah that'll explain why there's earthquakes sometimes too neurons and uh, and the muscles and uh, and we have germ cells these are the sperm and the egg and these are the cells, these are the only cells that can transmit DNA to the next generations. So, for example, if you go to the gym and you practice and you build up muscles, since it doesn't affect the DNA in your germ cells, the sperm and the egg, it doesn't lead to inheritance. And this is a fundamental principle. It's called uh, the second law of biology, the first being natural selection. And it's also known as the, known as the soma to germline barrier. The, se the germline is segregated from the soma. And the man who discovered this, uh, germ, this uh, barrier is August Wiseman. This is why it's also called the Wiseman Barrier. And he's a, a, a one of Darwin's most prominent followers. He worked in the 19th century, and he had many seminal contributions, many, many important discoveries. But uh, he wanted to prove... Lilith, so ma for working out. Nicely done, Lilith that what happens in the soma stays in the soma and that we cannot inherit acquired traits and to do so although he was a great biologist he did an experiment which wasn't that great in fact even george bernard Shaw wrote a play that mocks this experiment what he did was he for many consecutive generations he cut off the so this video gwen is 2019 but the work has continued so he has a fair number of papers um out on the phenomena it's been pushed further like the field on the in the area of there's been more fr fruit fly data gwen there's also been more worm data a fair bit of it left from his lab but there's a second lab in the united states that also has been leading the charge on that transgeneration of inheritance of behavior um and then there's been a couple of mouse studies that i'm aware of and that's that's mostly it so like it's still a hard field to get to push forward and it's still hard to publish because there's still going this um this initial thought of doubt as it were did the planarian cannibalism get proven um it's one spikes where like even the the memory one has been reproven but it's like in a really low tier publication so i think more people would give more credibility to it if it went to a higher tier paper because the idea and, and for better or worse that it's more academically rigorous to get a higher tier publication and to work out the molecular mechanisms of it the paper i'm thinking of just repeated the cannibalism and they found it to be the same but there was no like genetics of it there was no like real extra anything done if that makes sense the name of this gentleman uh is let me here we go I just want to make sure, Janie, that I have it copy pasted. What did I just move? I just moved it. I just moved it. Oh, I'm I'm so sorry, chat. We'll move it back. Here it is, Janie. Oded Rikavi. Here we go. So he's talking about the experiment of um, acquired traits. This one is where, you know, if you cut off a mouse tail and you cut off another mouse's tail and you mate them together, all of a sudden the, the, the embryo, the baby has a long tail. And this was the idea that this 
proves that you can't acquire traits by modifying your body from the previous generation. Like it's, because it's not in your germ cells, it's in your somatic cells. Germ cells are being egg and sperm, somatic cells being everything else. And so if I, you know, if I shave my head bald or I laser out my hair follicles on my head, my child is, is the idea would be, well, if it's acquired, my child will be born hairless. But because it's in my stems, my, my skin cells and not the germ cells, it wouldn't happen. And yep, germ for germination. So germination, like um, when a seed, a uh, plant seed germinates, um, is allowed the seed to grow and develop. And that's one example of that, of how that happens. Yep, indeed, Spikes, indeed. Fox, this experiment. What he did was he, for many consecutive generations, he cut off the, the tails of mice in every generation. And he, he suggested that the fact that they kept growing short, uh, long tails and that the short tails were not inherited shows that inheritance of acquired traits can't happen. Of course, we know this also from circumcision. We didn't know, need these experiments, but still it, it convinced the, the scientific world. And uh, just had the, he's a very good speaker and he throws in jokes left, right and center and he's, he's totally okay with it. Uh, the theory is we don't know what's down because we've only gone eight miles deep concert depth covering studies. My darling Sumiri, Sumiri, thank you for the subscription. Sumiri, how the heck are you doing? Welcome the heck in to the colony. Hope you're doing well, Sumiri. Uh, great to see you again. I uh, hope all has been well. Oh, and the Earth doesn't rotate. A flat earther bought twenty thousand dollar ring lasered gyroscope. To prove it's no rotate. Oh, gotcha. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Ridiculous and doesn't bear consideration. Agreed on that front. Agreed on that front. Uh, Samiria, thank you again for that sub. Welcome on in. We're talking about the acquisition of behavior to the next generation from unexposed parents. Uh, and became really a, a fundamental dogma. Okay. When I came to study this, I had a, a different uh, idea. I knew, of course, that DNA doesn't transfer between somatic cells and germ cells. And what happens in the soma to the DNA, if you get a mutation in your hand, it doesn't affect the DNA in your germ cells, which is the only DNA that counts for the next generation. But I thought that maybe another type of molecule would be able to, to transmit memories between generations. And, and the mo molecules that I thought about were small RNA molecules. RNA is a, is a close cousin of DNA. It's a more ancient molecule that evolved before. The world used to be an RNA world, and RNA enabled inheritance before DNA existed. And I had reasons to believe that maybe small RNAs would be able to move from the soma to the germline, because we knew, at least in C. elegans, in these worms, that they move between cells. What small RNAs do is inside cells, they regulate gene activity. So they decide which genes will function and which won't. OK. So to study this, I did a very simple experiment. Worms, this worm that I'm studying, C. elegans, is remarkably resistant to, to viruses. There are no viruses def that efficiently infect it. As the reason is that when you infect it with a virus, the worm produces small RNAs that match the viral genome and lead to its destruction. So what he's describing now is essentially a protective immune response of the worm to a virus. So it, the, you infect the worm with a virus, it makes small RNAs, and those are designed to kill the virus. Those small RNAs are going to be passed on to the next generation. Are the, the worms immortal? No, these are not immortal, Smike. So they do, these C. elegans don't regenerate like the planarians do. They have a limited shelf life. What's wild about planarians that are um, C. elegans that he's not talking about is there's a state called the Dower State. Ugh, insane! <laughs> it's insane, Smikes. What you can do, you can starve them, and and dehydrate them, and they will enter this period of stasis, where for months and months they will just stay put. They look like they're dead, and they're not. And then you can bring them back to life by just rehydrating them, like tardigrades. But the mechanism is different. Tardigrades, it looks like, utilize almost like an astro, um, uh, uh, what is it, uh, what kind of freeze? An antifreeze, like an engine antifreeze, versus these looks like it, it's more of through metabolism instead of changing their hemolymph. It's, uh, Alice, let me show you the, 
Let, let me grab. There, we will watch a video on it if y'all are interested. I believe it's... Oh, how do you spell it? Here it is. Okay. Actually, we can go ahead and watch. This is a short video. Um, on on this just basic nematode biology just their life cycle so why don't we watch this one allison and then we'll um we'll jump back to the video because like maybe maybe a little bit of preview of how their life cycle works would be a beneficial one pattern juggler it really is the spell is broken and we live again i love the gargoyles pattern juggler i actually pattern i went to the post office today because we had a bunch of stuff to mail off and after I mailed it off, I did stop by the comic book store because they've been releasing new Gargoyles comics, like a continuation of um, the original story. Um, but they didn't. They were supposed to have it in the beginning of the month, and now they've shifted it to the end of the month. So I don't. I don't yet have. I don't yet have the issue. Chat. I do what I have issues with, is if folks are not following the breathtaking, amazing friend by the name of Astro Professor Astronaut Jack. If you're not following Astro Canuck, you're not doing life right. Please follow Astro Canuck. Please go drop in that follow. Please enjoy his content. Astro photographer extraordinaire and Lego builder and all around extremely handsome. And he's also a published author, folks. Please go follow the amazing published author of Astro Canuck. Lilith, there is a whole additional um, comic book series that continues the Gargoyles. So actually, so Lilith, I don't know if you watched the show growing up. Seasons 1 and 2 are still part of the timeline. Season 3 of Gargoyles was made without Greg Weissman, the original creator of Gargoyles. He did not want the story to go in that direction. Disney told him that you're like we're doing what we want and so he's like, "Bye." And so they brought him back. He retconned season 3. Season 3 did never happen, which is great because it was not good. And then all of a sudden now they're putting out new comic books. I have them actually upstairs, otherwise I'd show you Lilith because I've been it's just a I, I enjoy just like um, checking out and just enjoying the I enjoy the, the the comic and just like reading it upstairs. I also like to dab sometimes too, like the chat is doing. But it's all kinds of Gucci chat. It's all kinds of Gucci. Um, Professor Canuck. We had a new we we did a new animation today, Professor Canuck. It's exclamation point push two. Electric Boogaloo. Three. 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 For the ambassador poosh. You think they'll bring back this? I hope so, Lilith. I hope so. I haven't heard of anything about a TV show or a continuation. There's been rumblings, Lilith, of a live action movie being made. They're also remastering the original game for Sega Genesis. Um, they put out a new board game, Lilith, of Gargoyles. <laughs> available at target so it's possible uh, there will be new gargoyles things happening chat let's quickly look in the life cycle of the worm and then we'll move back to the actual like the the transgenerational data so this actually brings up an interesting question which is how could this regulatory module evolve how could it have come around in evolution well it could be that there's an advantage for the worms to get old so they have... No, actually, this is not the Seligan's life cycle. Hold on. We're going to watch this one. We're going to watch this one. Is This is the nematode. And then we'll jump back. We'll jump back to the transgenerational behavior. Sorry, y'all. We, well, we might as well do this full, fully and correctly, okay? Let's do it correctly. In 1913, a scientist named Nathan Cobb wrote the following. If all the matter in the universe except the nematodes were swept away, our world would still be dimly recognizable. Octavius, just so you know, this is all for you. Chad, I, and I love this. Octavius was just like, I have a question. And I love that about our stream, that we can rabbit hole for like another hour, like for an hour and a half already over just a question that I, I just can't be stopped because I get excited. 
I get excited. Chat, speaking of excitement, there is the breathtaking and beautiful yoga girl. She is a supermodel across the country, Canada, everywhere from Saskatchewan to Quebec to Montreal, and so much more. Chat, she's also a professional Tetris 99 player extraordinaire. And one of our besties. Chat, if you're not checking out Yoga Girl, you're not doing life right. Please check out and follow the amazing, the breathtaking. Yoga Girl, folks. We love you, Yoga Girl. Yoga, I hope you've been having an amazing day. Appreciate that, Caddy. Appreciate the heck out of Yoga Girl. Welcome to the heck, in. And thank you all for contributing to the Discord movie night. The Discord movie night. And, um. Where's my drink? What drink? Curiouser and curiouser. Actually, no, you, Yogurt. Crystal, <coughs> thank you for the hydrate. Crystal, we, um, we got excited, Crystal and Yogurt, on, um, uh, Octavius asked the question about transgenerational inheritance of behavior. And so now we are, um, now we're, we're, I, you did, I'm so, Allison. I, yes, Allison, you did. You did, Allison. You did. So, that's where we're rabbit holing on the transgenerational inheritance of behavior, but I thought let's actually delve a little into nematode biology as well before we get any, any further and, like, you know, a little bit. Because this was a rabbit hole yogurt, I didn't plot it, plot it out as well as I usually do. Kind of jumping around. Oh, and yogurt, there's two new commands. Yogurt, there is push to electric boogaloo. And there's also exclamation point pants. If you want a rendition of Nickelback about a song about pants by Nickelback, you can type exclamation point pants. Plus, we also have um, the push to. And that's Professor Canuck says electric boogaloo. Okay. We should find its mountains, hills, vales, rivers, lakes, and oceans represented by a film. Yogurt, I thought that because it has the ambassador logo and it was a little bit different, so I thought that would be a fun one to do. Pink Panther episode of the fly. I do not, Lilith. I. I remember Pink Panther, but it's been long enough where all of it is just kind of a haze at this point. I haven't seen it in a long time. Uh, and then Yogurt, the other one is exclamation point pants. And that's just a, uh, our friend Plain Old Trey did a parody of a Nickelback song. And it made me laugh so much. I like your pants around your pants. That I was like, can, I, can we please make this a sound? Because it's just it's so goofy and he 100% nails the Canadian gentleman that is Nickelback. I like your pants around your pants. And it was just, I, it just, it just, he's been doing it for a couple of days now and every time I just lose it. So if y'all aren't already following Plain Old Dre, go give Plain Old Dre a follow. You will not be disappointed. Um, and just, just have him. Just to have him sing his rendition of, of it. It is so very good. All Canadians say that. See, I, I figured, Yogurt Girl. I figured. Uh, Pink Panther, top 10 favorites. I Yeah, it's been so long, Chris. I need to rewatch. Chris, thank you for the 100 birdies. Thank you, Crystal. Appreciate you. Right, let's continue on the Nematode. Of nematodes. He wasn't writing a horror story, and he wasn't exaggerating. The world really is covered by tiny unnoticed roundworms. And it's worth paying them some notice because Cobb was right. We're pretty much waste. Professor Canuck! Astro Canuck, thank you for the 100 bitties, sir. Thank you, Professor Canuck, for the 100 bitties, my friend. Never expected. Always appreciated. Thank you, Professor Canuck. Deepen them everywhere at all times. And they're doing a lot more than you might. What's that mean? Um, and can of beans, there are, there is our, our specs. There are our specs for um, the microscopes that we have. So, can we have two microscopes? Um, we have a light microscope and a dissection. Thank you, Trey. I love your face, sir. I like your pants around your pants. 
Thank you, Trey. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Smikes. I gotcha. Lost. Smikes, I love the command. Excellent. Excellent! I like your pants around your pants. Yeah, Trey! All right. Y'all, I... When I tell y'all I was laughing for 30 minutes every day to Trey singing about pants, I wasn't kidding, and I'm so excited to put that into the stream. All right. Which, by the way, and we did shout out... We did chat about Draft Killer, too, so let's give Draft Killer a shout out as well. The lovely and amazing Draft Killer. Or, when we went over to Poop Witch's stream... Uh, called him Gefafe Killer. So that is the alt name of Giraffe Killer, is Gefafe Killer. Chat, let's continue. Sea elegants are nematodes that are have that transgenerational inheritance of behavior that we've been talking about. So they can inherit the behavior of the next generation of animals from an original stress. Let us go into a little bit about their basic biology and then we'll jump back into Oded's video and talk a little bit more about that transgenerational inheritance and what he ended up discovering. Right. Can be deadly, others might save the world. Here are seven reasons nematodes are worth paying attention to. First of all, okay, what is a nematode? Well, it's a worm. And remember y'all, we actually found nematodes this past Monday. Right, we found past Monday, uh, this past Monday, we found them underneath the microscope. Humans and other, yes! So Trey, actually my wife, Lita, um, she had a publication out. Here is her paper. It was on the first paper on fruit flies that did this. And they actually, this, so they inherit this ethanol preference. So essentially she got them to inherit addiction behavior. So they inherited the preference to drink alcohol because alcohol from the original stimulus made it so that it, it would um, benefit the animals against parasitic wasp. It would protect them. But then the next generation, even though they never saw the threat, they also did the same behavior. And so did the following generation. It went up to five generations. So they, in, they even though those generations have never seen the threat, they still had the behavior. And it turns out it's from a single neuropeptide that is turned down in exposed animals called neuropeptide F or NPF. And what you can do is you can measure. So right here, this sad face in the brain, those are the fan-shaped bodies. So those are the neurons that are responsible for visual learning and memory. And what you can see is in that little sad face, the amount of neuropeptide F went down. And what's really cool is, Trey, that neuropeptide F is also, in humans, it's just called neuropeptide Y. So that's how it's studied in, in humans is addiction behavior. Uh, it's like for neuropeptide Y. You can't do it with genetics in the humans, right? But you can do it in other mammals as well, uh, like mice. From the study of mice drinking cherry juice. Yes, yeah, yeah, and, and the next generation, yep. And Trey, what's even crazier is they did that with cinnamon as well. The smell of cinnamon, cinnamon plus electric shock made them afraid the next generation afraid of cinnamon and trey you might be like why the heck does this happen it's an easy way to adapt to the environment without having mutation so trey you can imagine three generations from now right maybe there's no longer threatening cinnamon smell around you you don't smell any no more cinnamon and so then you revert back to what you used to be. And you it's much easier to revert something that's a change in the architecture of the DNA versus change in the actual sequence. So what happens is the structure of the DNA changes to make it so that certain genes are less or more accessible. And then when you forget, it reverts back to how it was. Does that make sense, chat? So to avo avoid mutation, they just adapt to new triggers for a while. Yep, and then they will revert back. Because uh, a mutation trait is much harder to revert. Because if you try to revert it, you can make it worse or you can change it entirely. Yep, and they're also, uh, Ken is right, there is a, st it was a phenomenon called the Dutch hunger winter. So during World War II, um, folks in the Netherlands were starved by the Nazis, this particular towns as well. And the next generation of children who were, in their mother's womb, so when their moms were pregnant, they were born with diabetes. And it's because diabetes 
is actually beneficial in times of starvation because of how the, the sugar is processed. Moms who gave birth after the starvation had children without diabetes. And then the kids that had the diabetes, when they had kids, their kids reverted back to without diabetes. So it's this transient way to adapt to the environment. Does that make sense? Uh, it was, it, what's crazy is my wife and I were discussing this earlier. It's, yeah, right? It's, it's Trey. Sir, I love that you you and you and Mrs. Trey just describe just like sit around and chat about these things. It's it's, it's, it's so cool. I love that y'all do that. Um, and yeah, so mammals, flies, worms, uh, planarians have have these kinds of behaviors. Uh, humans as well, although with humans you can't show the mechanism is the big thing. It plays in the pest control mechanism. So Allison, Allison, there's probably ways that it does play into pest control. But the problem is to study these phenomena is very, very difficult and very expensive. And there's not enough money in research. Like you might see the effect, but to fund it and ask like the question of what is the biology behind it? What exactly are the genes and chromosomes affected? It's very pricey to figure that out unfortunately so you may never actually figure it out just like folks if you're not checking out our friend wrist rock you might end up being very sad in life so guys check out the amazing and breathing wrist rock 88 go check out risto we love you risto all right so nematodes are what we were chatting about remember we found some this monday in under the microscope they are translucent you can see their internal organs they are hermaphroditic at least some species are not necessarily this one in, in the video, but C. elegans classically that are studied in the lab. They self fertilize. Um, they're quite amazing animals. But a lot of animals are worms, turns out. Earthworms belong to a different group entirely, the segmented worms. Then there's the flatworms, the group that includes tapeworms, and depending on who you ask, there's a lot of other worm-like groups out there too. Only some of the things we call worms are nematodes, which scientists place in the phylum nematoda. Not that that narrows it down much, that phylum still represents a lot of worms. And by a lot, I mean nematodes basically run this show. It's their world, you're just living in it. But to put it in some horrible, horrible perspective, right now there's a little less than 8 billion people on planet Earth. By contrast, there are 57 billion nematodes. Not total, 57 billion for every human on Earth. That's 438.9 million trillion nematodes. The math is kind of wild of how much of that animal is. And remember, they don't even make up that much of the biomass in the world. It's just they're very small. There's just tons of them. Hello, Sean. Uh, another world story I enjoy has set up. There's a layer of salty soil. Two feet underground, yet plants exist everywhere. Is it just me or does that sound like a recipe for a barren world? I am not sure, Sean. I'm not... I don't know if there's a layer of salty soil two feet underground everywhere, right? There are locations, I'm sure, where there are, but there's ones that are probably not. And um, there's actually plants do adapt to different salinities. And that's actually, Sean, one thing that has been studied in, um, in the labs as, as well, is like, what is the genetic basis for adaptation with different soil compositions? One big one has been iron. So different concentrations of iron and that plants can grow on in particular rice. Because if you can genetically correct or change rice and allow it to grow in more iron areas or less, you can feed many, many more people. Yeah, which is kind of cool, I think. I like those odds of finding nematodes in my dreams. You might find some spikes. Um, so you say that my nematodes rival like the mycelium network. So I think mycelium network is much more, Trey. Ants and beetles are also like a much higher percentage. Like there's um, the biomass, like there's more, if you put all the ants together, just the ants on earth, you will like, you have more biomass of ants than you will have humans. The mycelial network is also like very pervasive and spreads throughout like, you know, connecting trees and a bunch of other creatures as well. So I, I don't, nematodes, while they are impressive in total number, I don't think it rivals Yes, Mike's is correct. If you add ants plus beetles, that's 50% of the earth. 
and yeah, as, as what's gnarly is there are currently 20,000 known species of ants, and it's predicted that we are, there's at least double, right? There's a, that we have not discovered, but there's 250,000 species of beetle, which is insane, right? Uh, and Buttspot is back. Welcome back, Buttspot. Buttspot's been unbanned, folks. Buttspot was banned, like, across... Yeah, Trey, Buttspot was banned on Twitch, right? Last week, I think? And I guess Buttspot is back. Welcome back, Buttspot! Yay! Uh, and, and Trey, our, our lovely mod Smikes, tends to um, nerf every Buttspot comment in the chat, which makes me so happy. Um, sometimes he gets... He nerfs Buttspot himself, but, you know, like... It, it just happens. Uh, I guess there would be very resilient plants to the least. Uh, the authors probably just wanted the MC to have easy access to cook for salting, but I got me thinking. Sean, it's a great question. Uh, and there's, yeah, there's researchers working on modifying plants to grow in different environments as well. Presuming that plants are able to fix nitrogen from air, the salt being rinsed away through the water cycle, one can assume the depth of non-saline soil will improve over time. For sure, Allison. But if you're trying... It's that initial planting period, right? Like if you're trying to get them to grow at the very, very beginning, that might be a big difficulty, right? Because like, how, how would you get them to grow if the, the the salt is very close and the roots are touching them? Are they modifying plants for Mars soil yet? I don't know, Can. Maybe. Uh, I know we're modifying plants for different soils across the world. My easy guess would be is that it's not it, it can't be too far away than doing it for mars right because if we can already modify a bunch of the genetic components for on earth it's just you know you have to modify a few more things but if you look at the composition of the soil on mars and like how much iron and how much other things are in there presumably you just modify a couple more genes um it probably is harder than that but that would be my guess considering osmotic pressure within the soil itself we'd have to assume the salt would rinse away before it it was whisked away i i agree allison yep and look at that. I'm remembering, Alice. I'm remembering! Now, the question will be, Allison, will I remember tomorrow? That's the question. That estimate is for soil nematodes, by the way. There could be even more that don't live in the soil. Put differently, according to one estimate, four out of every five animals that live on our planet are nematodes. So, Four out of every five planet animals on this Earth are nematodes. But yeah, again, remember this. Victory screech! <laughs> Good job, Ellie. I can see why Ellie's excited, Smikes. I can understand why Ellie's excited. Um, so in spite of that madness, right, of the, of the amount of nematodes there are and how much they comprise, um, yeah, I think it's really cool. Uh, Pergolin on Mars is difficult. Or probably, uh, I would imagine astronomy show, but I could see there being genetic modification that could be done to get them to grow better. It'll be a stepwise series, but I'm sure it's possible to be able to do at some point. Do me a favor. Go out into the... Uh, okay, let's wait. We can wait for Kennedy. We can wait for Kennedy. I will tell Kennedy. There we go. We just told Kennedy to let us know when they return, because... I need to make sure what what the true question is. Woods and collect all the nematodes from one square meter of habitat. You will have several million. Yet yeah, these things are. Which is what I mean. We didn't have millions, but I think in all the samples that we looked at on Monday, I think if we had everything together, um, like, if, if we were to have rehydrated all that bark, we'd probably have a couple of hundred. Welcome back, Kennedy! Kennedy, what was your question? What was your question that can that be true? I wasn't sure, Kennedy, what that was referring to. So just let me know again what that was um, in response to. ...are barely noticeable. You don't see a horror movie-worthy mass of squirming invertebrates every time you open... 58 million for every one person. Yes, I believe so, Smikes. I believe so. Which I don't know, like, if... Like, Smikes, if we had a bag that was the size of a person, in both width, height, and length, um, how much would be filled up? Uh, so there, it wasn't talking about biomass, Kennedy. It was just talking about raw numbers, that there's a lot of them. That's not referring to the biomass. That's just, like, the straight-up numbers of them. 
I wonder how it later result of affect the worm community. Probably thicker skin, if not chitin. They don't have chitin, Sean. They have a like a thin membrane. So if you covered everything with salt, they'd probably have some kind of um, melting. So yeah, the, the the raw numbers it makes sense, Kennedy. But the, they were not talking about biomass though, because like Smikes was saying, if you add ants and beetles together, that's fifty percent of the world's biomass, which is you know, the number is total of ants and beetles then is less than the number of total nematodes, right? But like the amount that they make up in terms of mass is higher. Which is, it's all, it's all, it's all gnarly cool. Open the front door. That's because most nematodes are tiny, often microscopic. Still, the combined weight of all the nematodes on Earth is around 300 million metric tons, which equals about 80% of the combined weight of all the world's human. So there is your biomass statistic, Kennedy. 80% if you add together all of the nematodes, or if you get together all the nematodes, that's 300 million metric tons, that's 80% of humans. So that's still less than the beetles and the ants in terms of that mass, but there's a lot of them, which is why it's not too wild that we were seeing so many of those in our samples on Monday. Hi, Bean! Chad, the lovely and breathtaking and amazing Celestial Bean Artist in his house. Folks, you got to check out Celestial Bean Artist. Right? Amazing artist extraordinaire. She has that uh, art badge next to her name because she created the Science Stage Band. She's also just a breathtaking artist. Bean, I have your piece. It arrived. It's out in the living area. I need to bring it in here, Bean, and I'll, I can I can then show you. But Bean sent me a copy of her piece for the Science Art Gala, uh, along with some sneakers. Uh, and it's over. It's out in the living room right now, Bean. But I, I need to bring it into the office. But I'm like, I just like looking at it, and it makes me happy. And actually, Little Alona was looking at it today too. Bean, she now looks at stuff. She's like young enough, or she's old enough to start looking at stuff. And if you start moving it, her eyes move with it. Uh, like she was reaching and touching the blankets the past couple of days. Um, it was it was really really cool. Uh, and she, yesterday, Bean, she had her very first laugh. She had her first laugh ever, Bean. Yesterday, she didn't have one today, but yesterday she had a chuckle while she was smiling, and it was um. No, Bean. I, I I did not cry. I did not. I didn't get a video because I was changing her diaper, and you could imagine that the the diaper is um. You know that was that was the primary thing there to be doing, um. But I I very <laughs> I you know I, I was just like yo. No, no, I don't. I no, 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 no. I, I, the diaper's already gone, Bean. In fact, the diaper's, the diaper's far gone, Bean. Far, far gone. Um, yeah. What a, what a little sweetie, though. What a little sweetie. If anyone wants to see photos of Baby Lona, we have daily photos of her on the Discord. There's a whole channel dedicated to Baby Lona, so make sure, Chad, if you want to see cute, cute baby, and I might be a biased father. Go check out the Discord. Moments where I close my eyes after I say, "Don't ever forget this." Janie, I have pictures of her first and second ever smile. Here's her very first smile. Or, sorry, here's her second second smile. I have her first one pictured as well. That I had my camera for. And by the way, Janie, just having the cameras available um, is just awesome to be able to like take pictures of that. Yeah, it, it just... I couldn't, I couldn't imagine, Janie... Like, like when my mom was raising, like, right, there was, like, she didn't actually didn't have a camera. Or she, when she did, it was one of those old film cameras, and there was no way you had to do that. Uh, be patient, lose the diabetes. Oh, I know. I know. Kennedy. I know. I know. Kennedy. When you have boys, they go, Psh! Little one has only peed on me once. She's leaked out on me a couple of times. We've had, a, a, you know, an explosion from the diaper. But beyond that, you know, she's like when changing, she'll only pee on me once. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Kennedy, I it's a I have such patience for that little girl. I'm like, whatever, anything's fine. 
You, you want to scream? That's cool. You want to laugh? That's cool. You want to poop on me? It's also fine. Whatever you want. Like, whatever whatever you want, ma'am. That makes you smile. All right, Chad. Nematodes. Nematodes! By the way, Bean. Bean! We have a new animation, Bean. Poosh. Two. For the ambassador, Poosh Bean! For the ambassador, Poosh Bean. Makes me smile. Anywho, let's continue, chat. Codes on Earth is around 300 million metric tons, which equals about 80% of the combined weight of all the world's humans. Now, we're not sure how many species of nematodes there are, but estimates range from a few tens of thousands into the millions of species. A lot millions of species of them, which is crazy. Uh, order those fries, else we lose that same. I know, Kennedy. They're catching up. A lot of these species are undescribed because there are more nematodes than nematode scientists by a lot. But this is the same as true for other creatures as well. That we suspect there's a Galera, we can Galera the Dragon! Galaxy. Galera, thank you for the resub! Galera Dragon, Galera, how are you doing today? Thank you for your ongoing support. Welcome the heck in, madame. Chad, if you're not already out the legendary Galera Dragon, maker craft extraordinaire of the colony, please check out the one, the only legendary. Galera Dragon. No, Galera. Galera, come on. You know what we do here, Galera. We, we, how you say. I, now I, where's my button? Where's my button? Where's my button? Where's my button? Where's my button, chat? This is us in a nutshell. Whether it's self inflicted or not. Actually, Galera, this entire stream so far has been a rabbit hole because of a question Octavius asked. And I'm sure it could have been answered in five minutes. And instead, we're delving into the biology of so many different things and so many different animals. It's it's a riot, but it's just it makes a poor Octavius probably like, I, I y'all, I need to go to bed. I don't have time for this. And we're just like blah, 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 blah. observing and splitting recastification of species presenting near identical phenotypes. Yeah, Allison, there's a lot of changes, too, because there's morphological characterizations just based on the structure of them and how they look. No, 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 Octavius, I meant that in a very positive way. I meant that in my, like, I can see you being like, dude, I just wanted a simple answer, and you're just, you're still talking two hours later, and, like, we're not, we're, have, we, have we even gotten closer to resolving this? Maybe, I don't know, but probably not. Love your face, Octavius, love your face. Uh, going to tangents is the best thing. I'll never trade for any straight. Can't. I had a teacher who would only give you straightforward after one time I derailed class, and I'd never want to be that teacher. So let's we just rabbit hole left, right, and center. Maybe we should be devoting more of our study to our nematode overlords. Blint wooed Lita when she saw him and his design. No, 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 Kennedy. When Lita met me, I was wearing what she called mom jeans. And she was like, she even if you ask her now, she would be like, yeah, I, I, th I thought he thought he was cool. I did not start wearing nice fitted jeans. Hi, TD! Good work. Yes, the PP party went great, TD. How you doing, TD? I did not start wearing, like, nice jeans until she started buying me jeans. Before that, it was, like, the mom jeans. And she's like, all right, let's... She's like, you have a figure. Why don't we actually, like, go on with it? I know, and those jeans, my regular jeans aren't really designed. Kennedy, if I had designed jeans, first of all, we'd fix my cholesterol, okay? We'd fix my anxiety. We'd also, I don't know, change my metabolism rate, I think. There are jeans that fit. Well, Galera, they just fit differently in different places. They're not supposed to ever fit on your butt, I'm told. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? In some mushroom species, there's reclassification based on only spore shape. It's great. It makes sense, Alice, and I do wonder if it would be reclassified further upon, like, genetic sequencing. Um, prefer leggings or sweats? Janie, since working from home, I do love sweatpants, but it's too hot right now. So I, I can't do it in the heat now. Crying happiness for a couple of hours? Glad to hear it, TD. I'm glad it's happy tears. I'm glad it's happy tears, TD. Finally found 
uh, kind of were comfortable, but after a few years they changed. Yeah, that's the thing, Galera, is um, I know Lita will find particular cuts that she really likes, and then we buy like a few of them because otherwise it'll just be you'll have no idea. Like they just won't fit well, and it's just an absolute disaster, right? Definitely not Jane. Janie flipping suit. That's who. That's who. That's who. That's who. You're breathtaking. You can wear whatever you want to wear. Me, on the other hand, I got a lot of work done. I, 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 I need to work done. You know what I mean, Janie. Like, there's just just a lot to be done on this, right? It's, it, yeah. So, you know, if, if it can help me, like, tighten up my butt and buy me some jeans, it's Gucci. I do get reclassification based on sequencing. Oh, nice! Awesome. Excellent, Allison. I'm glad to hear it. All right. Nematodes? Nematodes? Let's go. Depending on who you ask, a single pair of rats may produce 15,000 descendants in a single year. But that is nothing compared to what nematodes can do. The large intestinal roundworm, for example, can lay as many as 200,000 eggs in a single day. These particular nematodes can also store as many as 27,000 eggs in their body at one time. Like, imagine if chickens could do that, we'd all eat nothing but omelets. And that wasn't enough for them. Can. I also found the, like the stretchy jeans, but they look like they're not stretchy. So they still look like they're solid, but they have a little gift to them. Oh, it's so good. Them, not all nematodes stick to a scheme of male and female for reproducing. The well-studied nematode C. elegans has males and hermaphrodites capable of fertilizing themselves, but no females. A related species, referred to as Rhabditis sb347, this is how we have to name nematode species, has the reason we have to name nematode species like that is because the first nematode that was identified was C. elegans, like for research work. And there it was identified your naming scheme. So whenever you identify a mutant and C. elegans, you have, it's a very, very particular naming scheme. It has to have like three letters of the lab that it was discovered in, some combination of the date, a genetic identifier. And so it's a series of numbers and letters that is defined uh, no, 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 Ken, it's not because we ran out of names. It is because that community has a very, very strict way of naming genes and, like, different mutants. And it has to be done in that way. Otherwise, it's not recognized. It is, unlike with fruit flies, Canada, you can do, like, there's fruit fly mutants called the, you know, red shirt after Star Trek characters, right? Who die early. Or Kennedy. Kenny, right? But instead... And worms, you have to have this like numerical letter combination. Sired so two children who were born 55 weeks apart and feel somewhat unproductive, although my kids are awesome. You know what, Kennedy? Having awesome kids is important. A lot of people don't have awesome kids. A lot of people have jerk kids that, you know, kick people and spit on people and run up to little Belint and rub cow poo on his clothes. That's not cool. I bet your kids would never do that. Hello, let us grow! One, two, three. It's good to see you, Let Us Grow. I hope you're doing well, Let Us Grow. I hope you're doing well. And hermaphrodites. Having more mating partners available, including yourself for the hermaphrodites, creates a ton of flexibility. They can find partners or a single hermaphrodite pioneer can go forth and multiply. Because apparently there aren't enough nematodes already. Whatever their sex, nematodes are built for breeding. An adult C. elegans only has about a thousand somatic or non-reproductive cells in its body, but it may have a roughly equal number of germ cells devoted to reproduction. So if you're a nematode, a pretty big percentage of your body is just dedicated to making more nematodes still it's quite remarkable that's why they're studied primarily for reproduction uh, those people don't want to have it. oh yeah absolutely kennedy you don't need to have kids to be valid in any way like that's it's never ever a thought that i was trying to insinuate i just mean some some parents have rude kids that's all i was trying to get at i named this nematode alex this one bertha this one clyde this one zoe this one i mean Allison, if that is how that went, I would have, I would chuckle so very much. That would be absolutely beautiful. I would very, very much enjoy if that was in fact the case. <laughs> it was like, and this one, and this one, and this one. And you know what? It's all fine. It's all fine and dandy.
Still, they can't be everywhere, right? There are lots of places where life is sparse. Maybe you could escape the worms by moving to the Arctic or something. But no, you cannot. There are at least two species of nematode that are specifically adapted to living in Arctic ice. Which, by the way, at some point we should do a dive in Arctic insects and Arctic critters, like microorganisms. They are quite remarkable. I, almost, I had the chance if I would have gone to University of Cincinnati to go to a, for a six-month trip to the Arctic to study the Arctic midge. Um, I did not take that opportunity, but it's a possibility. What's stronger in your opinion? Answer spiders. Stronger in what sense, TD Fox? Nematodes have antifluids and broths. Or do, so nematodes do have blood, Canada. They're, it's called hemolymph. But it's it's just like the more primitive word um, for how it, for how the what it actually like works as. What those nematodes do, we don't fully understand. Just like there's, um, I think with the the tardigrades, it's more understood that there's like an antifreeze component to it. Uh, with nematodes, they go into a state called a dower state for preservation, and that is different from the the tardigrade version of it. Um, but I don't know if we know about the antifreeze properties. For the midge, I think we've started to identify, but the last time I saw the papers weren't yet out. Um, strength and mobility. I think it's tough to compare TD Fox. I think that they are both strong and mobile, but for what they need to be strong and mobile in. Like the tensile strength, right, of silk in the, for a spider one could argue that's part of its strength repertoire and that on its own makes it stroke makes it very strong but that might be a different strength definition than the lifting that others do right for the ants do so I, it's it's a tough question because they're just adapted to different things i'm sorry td fox i know that's not an ideal answer but i feel like that's probably the best answer that i can give you that's like staying true to the science behind it uh for those who have it can be everything yep uh, our son works for Staples as a tech. Daughter is Kennedy Space Center. Uh, nothing better than having your kids teach you something unless it's them teaching your grandkids. No, Yo, that's beautiful. Kennedy, that's beautiful. Yes. At least one of which eats other nematodes, by the way. So if you really dislike creepy crawlies, you can't escape in the far north, nor the far south. The most abundant land animal in Antarctica's polar desert is, wait for it, a nematode. And of course, they are also everywhere in between. Some nematodes also thrive in hot, dry conditions. Some, in fact, can live in places that are totally inhospitable to humans and most other animals. Like Mono Lake in the eastern Sierra Nevada mountains, which is the saltiest lake in California, it also contains enough arsenic to make it dangerous for humans and fish. In a 2019 study published in the journal Current Biology, researchers identified eight species of arsenic-resistant nematode. All eight species found on the lake can tolerate about 500 times the amount of arsenic that would kill a human. Just knowing this vast array of nematode biology, it would be really cool to figure out more of the genetic basis for these, because they almost have tardigrade-like strength. Um, but yeah, not enough is even known about them as well. It's kind of crazy. Is there a lake that they found arsine-based life? I do not believe so, Allison. There, everything is carbon-based life. Um, there is nothing that I'm aware of that is anything but carbon-based life. There might be arsenic that they can tolerate, but there is no arsenic-based life that we've identified on this planet or other planets as of yet being. So they don't mind the cold, they don't mind the heat, and they don't seem to care too much about being poisoned. Nematodes aren't especially shy either. They enjoy the company of other animals. Some of them like to share a meal because they're intestinal parasites, so they will literally share your meal like after you've eaten it. Others prefer to live in close company with other species, like the hookworm, which also thrives in innards but doesn't bother with intestinal contents. Instead, juveniles live off the blood and tissue of their Hosts. Not all nematodes are parasites, but some scientists think parasitic species may number around 25,000. And those are just the ones that parasitize vertebrates. In fact, some researchers think that one out of every two animals has its own parasitic nematode, which cozies up to no other type of animal. How very sweet. Humans got lucky. I got the pee!
We have around 60 species that like to parasitize us, though we get to share at least some of those with other organisms. Capillaria philippinensis, for example, usually parasitizes birds, but humans can get it from eating certain kinds of fish. That can happen when we eat the fish, instead of the normal bird predators that the nematode counts on for its life cycle. Humans can also become infected with trichinella, too, but so can pigs and feral hogs, mountain lions, and bears. And a parasitic nematode infection isn't just gross, some can be deadly, especially if left untreated. Move over, viruses. There's a new friend in town. Nematodes' planetary domination isn't new. At least, we don't think it is. Nematodes have soft bodies, and they decay rapidly, so they're not commonly found in the fossil record. Even so, the oldest known nematodes date to 400 million years ago. Some scientists think nematodes have been around a lot longer than that, though, for at least a billion years. If that's true, it means they evolved just after after bacteria, protozoa, and fungi, and way before pretty much everything else. The first parasitic nematodes probably evolved from free-living marine nematodes. They likely evolved to parasitize marine invertebrates. Should we try to be in the fossil record? What do you mean, Kennedy? Like, people? It's hard to get the nematodes out of the fossil records. There's some imprints in stone of them, but given their size and just their their biological properties and how like they're really water-based thin membrane outside layer you're gonna it's gonna really be difficult to any kind of get any out of imprint or preservation of them so it's the way that they're predicting that they're so old is a function more of um genetics versus actual like physical evidence a nematode is their own living class. No, no, no. So they fall into an animal. Crystal, sleep well! One is not tethered by earthly limitations. Let's can't. Let's, pop, let's show, show it up real Come. quick. They grab the, the phylum that they're in. Uh, so we can break it down. Yep, they're kingdom animalia. It's science. It is science. So we can go over... Uh, hi, Ghost. Welcome in. Crystal, thank you for the bitties. Crystal, thank you for the bitties. Um, so if we look here... Yep, Canada, if we look here, you can see they're currently they're classified in the kingdom Animalia. And then Phylum Nematoda. So very high on the order of things. Like, as soon as you have the animal radiation, immediately it jumps over to... Um, Nematodes. Debs! Debs, listen. You are breathtaking. You are amazing. I hope you sleep well. And I appreciate the heck out of you, Debs, for everything you do. Folks, if you don't already follow the YouTube page, check out the YouTube. All run by the breathtaking and amazing Debs. Please check out the YouTube page. And she's been... Debs has been just absolutely crushing the video content on the, the YouTube. Debs, thank you for everything you do. Love you. Please to sleep well, Debs. Please to sleep well. Concerned about how now I am a regenerative gardener farmer, I feel like this could be something gardeners should be educated on. For nematodes, nematodes are in, in a lot of garden soils as well, and they could be affecting your um, like crops and resources as well. And Ghost, thank you for the follow, Ghost. Welcome on in. Um, favorite pack animal? Dogs, fox, and why? I just I don't know. I love dogs. Like wolves, they're very cool. I think. Back in 2010, they found a bacterium in Mono Lake that believed substituted arsenic for phosphorus in the DNA studios. Then apparently, it was found two years later not to be the case. Yeah, Allison, I do not believe that there's anything that's not a carbon-based life form in this world. Um, the our whole theory on how this planet evolved, um, there that's. They just don't. That just not. It's not. It doesn't fit into that hypothesis. It would be incredible if identified. It would turn the whole theory of life on Earth on, on its head. But I don't think there's any evidence of that. Replacement about phosphorus of D in DNA. Oh, not the carbon. I got you. So it was still a carbon-based life form, Cliff. But the phosphorus. I got you. Thank you, Cliff. I'm so sorry. I totally misunderstood. Uh, meaning, could it get in our bodies? It could let us grow, yeah. So parasitic nematodes like ringworms and um, other worms that in the soil could get into your body. 
um, when you're gardening. That is 100% possible. Ringworm, there's another one too that's like available in the garden soil that it could get into as well. So you do have to be careful, pay attention to, um, just make sure you're washing stuff and don't have, um, usually th there is one lettuce grow, I cannot remember which one it is, but it can bore through skin, which is why it's, um, like walking around outside barefoot can be a bad thing. Um, I, I, God, I, it might be ringworm, but it's again, it's another one of these parasitic worms. I know tapeworms usually undercooked meat, uh, but there's a lot of these parasites that can get into you. Hello, Gatologic. Welcome on, Gatologic. How you doing, Gatologic? Welcome on. So not only have they been around since the dawn of multicellular life, some of them have been getting a free ride off of other organisms the whole way. Now, nematodes are very basic life forms. Really, they're just tubes that digest food with a few other rudimentary organs thrown in there. But they are still animals, like us. They're simple, and yet there is a seemingly endless variety of these things. And not all of them follow the microscopic and innocuous model. Some of them get weird. The biggest nematode, Placenta nema gigantis. Ringworms by fungal infection. There's one astronomy show that I know bores through your skin and, and manifests in like a, a very interesting looking way. I can't, I have to read back up on which one it is, but it is a relative of, um, of the nematode. Like if it's in the nematode phylum. Pissima. Octavius. Octavius, thank you for the tier one gifts up to Astronomy Show. Astronomy Show, please thank Octavius. Please enjoy the ad-free viewing and the emotes made with love. Thank you so much, Octavius, for that gift sub to the lovely Astronomy Show. Appreciate the heck out of you. As a kid, my dad told me that the Bible says not to eat pork because modern refrigeration preservation methods didn't exist and pigs could get infested with tapeworm, easily pass on to us if undercooked. Maybe Galera. I am not a historian, so I do not know. It sounds like a very plausible hypothesis, um, but I, I just don't know. It'd be a neat, it'd be a neat explanation if that was the case. Uh, can reach between eight and nine meters in length. It also lives in the placenta of a sperm whale, so that's why you've never seen one. Some nematodes even have, like, fur. It's actually a thick layer of bacteria that oxidizes sulfur, which makes it possible for this particular type of nematode to survive in sulfur-rich habitats on the ocean floor. They do creepy things, too. Nematodes pee through their skin, for example. Kinda. Humans and other mammals excrete nitrogen waste as urine. Nematodes can't be bothered to wait in line for the restroom, so they excrete nitrogen waste directly through their body wall. Also, some nematodes have amoeboid sperm, which means it doesn't swim, it crawls. So despite the fact that their basic body plan is just a gut, they do manage to be pretty weird. Nematodes have also taught us a surprising amount of what we know about our own bodies. In particular, C. elegans, that well-studied species we mentioned earlier, is widely used for biological research. Scientists like this particular nematode because each adult has a fixed number of cells. What's more, those cells develop according to the same pattern every time, which makes it possible for scientists to follow the fate of each one as the organism develops from an embryo. Even though C. elegans is a very simple creature, many of its genes have functional counterparts in much larger animals like humans. Nematodes also share some of the same biological characteristics as humans, like some of the same tissues. Skin cells, neurons, muscles, and others have all passed down to both humans and nematodes from a common ancestor. Research using C. elegans has led to a lot of really important breakthroughs like discoveries about human kidney disease and improving our understanding of cancer. C. elegans was also the first multicellular organism to have its entire genome sequenced. And because C. elegans produces more than a thousand eggs a day, with a life cycle only lasting two weeks, they can provide scientists with a never-ending supply of themselves. We kind of have to love nematodes, or at least acknowledge their worth, because not only are they medically important, they can help us in other ways, too. In fact, they can teach us a lot about the most important scientific challenge of our Hi, Hugh. I'm a toad. He's a toad. Nematode. Hugh, how you doing today? Welcome on in. 
time, the climate. Nematodes are major players in the carbon cycle. They exhale roughly 2% of soil carbon emissions, emissions that come exclusively from organisms that live in soil. That's roughly equivalent to 50 Bit Gamey! No, sir, I love your face, Bit Gamey. Bit Gamey, how is your evening going? I hope the noms went well, Bit Gamey. I hope the noms went well. I love your face, Bit Gamey. AKA Master. Are we gonna see Bit Gamey tomorrow? Are we gonna see you tomorrow, Bit Gamey? I hope so. I hope so. Chat, I miss Bit Gamey streams. I, I miss Bit Gamey all week. I miss Bit Gamey all week. Um, now you vegetarian, go figure out for personal reasons that nothing to do with religion. I love meat, Galera Dragon. But Lita. Lita is a vegetarian for personal reasons as well. So we have a split household on that. There's never any wrong with, um, I can eat meat in front of her and she doesn't care. She just personally doesn't. It's not Galera. She has, um, her stepsister has a husband who, dis who sometimes is vegan and sometimes is vegetarian, depending on their mood. And he will cry in front of his wife at the dinner table if she eats anything that's meat. I feel like that's something that they should talk about. But went to a German restaurant. How was it? Was it gluten toggy, or was it did it have enough gluten dog in a big gamey? Nervous to come over and eat with y'all. Why, Andrew? Andrew, what do you eat, sir? <laughs> Andrew, lead us as vegetarian, and I eat a ton of stuff. Can we see episode of some Bob Offish? Never, KK. How are you doing, KK? Welcome on in, KK. Welcome in, KK. Chat, now I'm worried about Andrew. Jaeger schnitzel, French fries, pea salad. Oh, big gamey, was it? Did you use toilet paper? And red cabbage, definitely sergut. Vigetta! That sounds excellent, big gamey. Big gamey, I'm glad you had a lovely meal. Um, the, schn the schnitzel sounds really good, big gamey. The schnitzel sounds. I hope you had some pretzels as well. Get some pretzels. Pea salad was on the menu. The carnivore diet, Andrew, listen, that's why when you come over, I'm just going to barbecue six pounds of meat for you. Of various kinds of meat. You know, we're going to have, we'll do sirloin, we'll do pork, we'll do fish, we'll do burgers, we'll do hot dogs. <sighs> Might as well do some bacon while we're at it, Andrew. Um, what else should we do? Yeah, Andrew, you just, just, just hit me up a list of all the insane kinds of meats you can think about. We'll go to Wegmans, we'll get some meats, and I'll just cook up a giant potpourri for you. I'll cook you so much stuff, Andrew, that you won't be able to move. That's my goal, that you will be outside on the hammock, and you'll just be you'll just be hanging out outside on the hammock. And just, like, just needing a, just a break. Just a giant break, Andrew. You'll be like, oh my goodness gracious, I'm so full. And he's like, you'd be like, he finally did it. He got me full. I'm like, it's going to be a beautiful day, Andrew Susie. And I'm glad that you eat omnivores, because there's a lot of them, Andrew. Some of them need to be eaten. Havoc, yes. Uh, KK, it is the best thing Gucci. ever. It's Andrew. It's one of the, it's a standing unit, so it's not hooked up to two trees. It's a standing metal unit, and then you hook the one to either, like, metal rod, and then you just lay on it. And Andrew, one of, I haven't been able to do it this season. It's not because of the temperature but you know the little one is like going outside and just like resting in that hammock it's just like last summer just like hanging out there and just like oh it was it's so relaxing and when what's nice is Lita got it for me for my birthday and it's a solid like it's it's not one where it like curves in on your back because my shoulders would get totally nerfed so instead it's taut ropes and so it stays like a flat rectangle um it's really nice. Home Depot, KK. Home Depot. It's only one bedroom, but I think of getting a loft bed. Andrew, listen, when you move in with us, it'll be fine. Okay? That's all that's all you and Andrew, it'll be fine. We have um we have space. You might have to share a room with Alona, or you can share the downstairs with Noodle. But, you know, it, then you can have the hammock outside. You just go outside and you just chill out there. And I'll I'll lean out look out the office window, because I look right at the hammock, right? And I can be like, hey, Andrew, and you can go, like, Hey Blood! And then you'll be all good. And then, Andrew, that's where the ducks are, too. There's those two ducks that visit us every year. You can hang out with the ducks. Can you be roommates with Noodle? KK, that depends. Do you accept the fact that Noodle's the best cat? Of all the four cats. 
if you accept this, if you pull it into your heart, then you can also be roommates with Noodle. But she will not stand for anything. You agree? Then yes, KK, you Gucci. You Gucci. By the way, KK, we don't have a Gucci from you yet. By the way, KK, we don't have a Gucci from you yet. KK, where is your Gucci? Gucci. I don't think we've gotten one from you. Danger from you, Janie Flippin' too. That's who, that's who, that's who. Janie Flippin' too. I don't believe you said it's a Gucci. Well, that's pretty Gucci, eh? KK, you don't need to make one. I would just love for everyone to make one. Because, KK, if you do, then you're added into rotation. Currently, we have, I think, 54 different Gucci's. KK. I'd love to have your Gucci, Gucci. be in there as well. It would make it would make our hearts sing, KK. There's a channel, folks, on the Discord. It's all Gucci. Called Say Gucci. And you can add in your sound clip of putting in on the Gucci. And, um... Then we add it into the stream. Yes, Big Gaming, you did win one. Big Gaming, you won it one today from the MoCo's giveaways while you were modding for Jern. That's when you won, Big Gaming. I was there, Big Gaming. I saw you win, sir. I bit bit listen. The one thing I really wanted to win, Big Gaming, was that beautiful um, piece by Dev, the flamingo. Uh, but someone else won, Big Gaming. Someone else won. But I saw you win because you were modding for Irish John, and then you won on the Mocos channel. The Babe Pink Skulls, that's true, too. Maybe free to see Thug Shell 20th of April. Very nice, TD Fox. So you win when I was modding for Jerk. I thought you won, too, Big Gaming. Big Gaming, listen, the days have kind of blended together a bit. I could have sworn that I saw you win, but you were also in Jern's stream. Maybe you won two, Big Gaming. Did you want two? Twitch got two, Twitch got two, Twitch got two. I don't know, the Big Gaming. That's good. They were. Teen percent of the carbon we emit through fossil fuels. They also respond to changes in temperature and precipitation in really important ways. For example, a 2019 study found that drought conditions in grasslands can harm populations of predatory nematodes. That leads to an increase in their prey, nematodes that eat grass roots. And that can have a snowball effect in a negative way on grass growth. So this is the interesting question of what if we just wiped out all nematodes? They have an important part in the ecosystem. They maintain populations of other animals and keep things growing. So if you got rid of nematodes, there would be negative consequences. Just I only point this out because we have had questions where what happens if you get rid of all mosquitoes? And it turns out to be a bad thing, right? When root-eating nematodes overeat, the grass weakens and dies. Meanwhile, microbial respiration releases even more carbon into the atmosphere, which means even subtle changes to the climate can be amplified via the effects on nematodes. Just because the things being affected by climate change... They are a keystone species because of that. So they're also, they're prey, KK, but they're also big regulators of the environment. It's... And, but I, I think KK, like, the definition of keystone species is kind of loosey-goosey at this stage because there's a lot of animals that if you remove, not only are they important predators to keep other populations at bay, but they're also prey for other things. And so it's like the classic definition of keystone species, I think, is constantly shifting because of that reason because we're recognizing that more and more of the network of animals is like regulated in a much more of a giant, like, not just a web, but almost a giant yarn ball that's been played by with a cat. Like, it's just all strung together. Change are microscopic doesn't mean that the consequences can't be felt. So we have to keep nematodes in mind when building our understanding of climate change. The whole film of nematodes thing may be a little bit gross. Things that writhe and squirm and live in your guts aren't usually very high on people's lists of favorites. Thankfully, most nematodes are so tiny that they're functionally invisible. But that doesn't mean you can ignore them, because they are also really, really huge in more ways than one. Thanks for watching this episode of SciShow, and thanks to our patrons for making it happen. We're pretty sure we have the coolest community of supporters ever, and they make it possible for us to provide free educational videos for everybody on the internet. If you want to get involved, head on over to patreon.com slash scishow. So biology is codependent on just me. Alice? Un Allison? I almost slept, Allison. Yes. All right, chat, now that we have a better 
grasp on the importance of nematodes. We can jump back to the transgenerational inheritance of behavior in nematodes remember that's the video that the whole question that kicked off from uh, octavius remember to set back up we were talking about heritable heritable immunity so hopefully octavius it sets the framework of why nematodes are cool to study so this particular remember assay that he was testing was he infected the nematodes with a virus the nematodes produce these small rnas to destroy the virus and the question is Will the next generation inherit these independent of infection? They simply chop it up. And there was a Nobel Prize awarded for this discovery for how, how these small RNAs work. What I showed, that this was very new and exciting at the time, was that small RNAs work not only in the parents, but they are also transmitted to the next generation and to the next generation and to the next generation to, eff uh, to effectively vaccinate the kids. So if the kids are again challenged with viruses, they are already prote protected. So I, th I think it's super cool, like the way his analogy was <clears throat> that the, the and wait for an MD. I love the echo, the reverb on there. Here you go, one more time, NMD. Hi, Kai. I like your pants around your pants. What do you think, NMD? I like your pants around your pants. It's a uh, it's one of those um, Nickelback songs. It's a Nickelback cover about the pants, NMD. That's sung by our friend Plain Old Trey. And there's nothing plain about that song. That's an amazing song right there. Chat, this is the beautiful piece by the legendary Smorphosaurus. Delint? How dare Smorf? Dinosaur Belint is Delint. Confirm, chat. Smorf, I, this is my favorite part right here. Is so cutie patootie. I love it. It's so cutie patootie. Gucci. Thank you for the clip, Hugh. Thank you for the clip. That's not what I was expecting. Is it okay, NMD? Or are you upset, NMD? Did you make you smile, laugh, and chuckle, NMD96? Or was it, like, disappointing? There's Solus? Why would you say that, Smorf? Smorf, do you see these beautiful shades that you've done in these colors? Do you see the smile? Do you see the love in spite of that there's no pupils? These are not soulless. These are lovely, Smorf. Smorf, I'm going to delete that comment because that suggests that your art is anything but breathtaking. And I'm not okay with this, Smorphosaurus. Your comment has been deleted, Smorf. And I will never again take that self deprecation from you. You're an amazing artist, especially with your dinosaur art, although you have made some cursed things, as you have claimed. Uh, but I very much enjoy your artwork. Smorf, thank you again for the raid and for sharing your beautiful piece with us. Again, I really... See, NMD2 is like, it's so cute. Smorf, my favorite part of your art a lot, I know, point this out every time, is how talented you are with the shading and the color work. It always turns out just beautifully. And thank you for... Thank you for doing what you do. Hi, Epoch! Epoch, we had you very high. How are you doing, Epoch? You make lovely animations and all things Smorphosaurus. Guys, if you're not checking out the Legendary Epoch, Epoch is where we went to today after the Moco Loco stream. Epoch, how was your evening? Was it amazing? Was the game lovely? Uh, NMD, when you're blushing your teeth, I like your pants around your pants. Please, NMD, when you're brushing your teeth, what are you going to sing? I like your pants around your pants. Have a good one, NMD. Undertale was hilarious um, and delightful. Awesome, Epoch. Guys, Epoch is a legendary uh, pixel artist as well. Epoch, I have something from the mail from you today. Um, when I'm... No, brushing, not blushing. Brushing your teeth. When you're brushing your teeth. The letter, indeed. Oh, boy, let me, Chad, let me show you all the piece I got from Epoch today. Chad, there is something beautiful in here. I like your pants around your pants. <laughs> Andrew's like, I know that song. Indeed, Andrew. Um, well, this beautiful piece from Epoch. This was Epoch's entry to the Science Art Gala. Check this out, y'all. There's no holes in it, but it was an Epoch's Antonia in your own art style.
and I it, it turned out so good. Epoch, it looks it's awesome. I let me show you actually without the color messing up. So Epoch, I Lita and I opened it up today, and I was like, well, and Lita, Lita was, she was like, we need to get um. We need to get frames and whatnot to uh, uh, frame all these. So epoch, there's gonna be. Um, I wanna. We wanna build like a, a like some of our books upstairs in the office. We're gonna take. We're gonna build a shelf downstairs and put some of the old textbooks down there, and then there's gonna be an Antonia art shelf, in it because in addition to hanging on the walls, and that we will, I can't wait to put this out. Uh, I also love the other bug Pokemon you have on here. It it turned out it. It's beautiful. Epoch, the only thing... You can't rush art. That when we meet, I need you to sign it. That's the that's the only thing, Epoch. That's the, I need you to sign it. That's all, my friend. Because right now, there's no signature on it. And it may, that, that makes me sad. But one day, when we meet, you'll sign it. And it'll, then it'll be perfect. It'll be, it'll be absolutely glorious. I know it's silly, but I really like... Um, artist signatures on any piece that I get. Um... I mean, because it's your beautiful work, and it's just, I don't know, to me it's more special when it's signed. It's like the artist, it, it, it doesn't, it feels like, you know, they, they, they're they immortalized on the piece, if that makes sense. If I send you an art piece, I'd sign, wait, oh, thank you, Smorf. Uh, Smorf, I hope so. Smorf, you know, you know, Smorf. I have feelings on anyone Smorf. That is Smorf. That does not just go for Epoch. That goes for all of artists Smorf. Um, to having like your piece is signed. By the way, Smorf, thank you for the raid and thank you for the beautiful sharing of your work. Um, so yeah, Raiders, we are talking about transgenerational inheritance of behavior in nematodes. Let's get back to our video. Thank you again, Smorfosaurus, for the raid. Love you, Smorf. Anytime? Well, you know what? I love your face, Smorf. All the time, Smorf. All the time, Smorphosaurus. All the time, Smorphosaurus. I never been so loved between you here and Moko. Uh, I just never felt so loved and encouraged. No, thank you, Epoch. And that goes for everyone. Like, listen. One of the reasons why you might be like, blunt, why did like why are you part of a stream team? I was so hesitant for the longest time of being part of any kind of stream team. The reason that the Moco Loco spoke to me Together, is that Cyber the galaxy. came in on the Spurbosaurus, but hi, hi, Cyber. Thank you so much for the resub. For four months. Thank you very much for that ongoing support. Please enjoy that ad free viewing and all the emotes that we make with love. How you doing, Cyber? Welcome on in. Um, so, Epog, I joined the stream team because. I believe in how the Mocos run things. I believe in giving folks a platform. I believe in lifting up each other. And I believe that that's the best kind of community that we can have is one where we lift each other up. There's plenty of stream teams where that does not happen. There's plenty of communities where that doesn't happen, where you're all worshiping one person. And I would hope that people feel like that's not the case here, but we are a community and we lift each other up. And so that Epoch, you, Smorf, a lot of members of this community are so freaking talented and if we could at like at all like get y'all closer to your dreams of whatever you're doing and whatever you want to achieve in life then it means that we've done something good here and so that's a big personal goal epoch is um bring joy to and like, to your goals and to your hearts if any way I can facilitate that using our platform, that's what I want to do. So you think that someone is dinosaur themed? I don't think there is an existing one like that, Smorf. You could very much make one then. I didn't stream with no idea what I would do, but I always try to support my students. Once I saw the same energy from Mocha, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And everyone in this beautiful network has done the same. We push each other. Yeah, exactly, Epoch. There is love between each other and we push each other, but in a good way. Like it's... It's like, you know, oh, I'm scared to do this. You just try it. You can do it. And then you do it and you're like nervous, but then everyone's supportive of it. And then you just grow and evolve as an artist, as a scientist, as a maker and crafter, as a gamer, what have you. That's how we all get ahead. It's much, 
epoch it's like the the adage of you know if one person in the community does well then everyone does well because we're part of a community so it's let's celebrate each other's victories it's only good for it's it's good for everyone if one of us does well then all of us do well uh exactly epoch we lift as we climb i like that now what i do streaming wise about you are a smurf you are a smurf Support is not a cult. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Absolutely not a cult. Absolutely not a cult. Uh, neither is our lovely and breathtaking hero that is Thug Shells. She just definitely does not have a not a cult. She instead has a not a cult. Right? It's different. So if you want to join the not a cult, you can follow Thug, Th Thug Shells. Especially if you don't want to don't want to have a cult. But if you want a not a cult, then you can join that one, right? And so sleep well. Professor Canuck and Astro, great stream this morning. I love waking up to you. Um, if I get to wake up to you tomorrow morning again, even more Gucci, my friend. Sleep well and have a great evening, and thank you for everything you do as well, sir. All right, transgender inheritance, let's go. So it's a heritable vaccine, an acquired trait, viral resistant. Gucci. That Hi, Captain Coder. Welcome in, Captain Coder. It was passed on to the next generation. This also allowed us to study the mechanism of how it works. We learned a lot about the genes involved and so on. The next thing was that uh, we thought that maybe it's not only about viruses. Maybe other traits can also be regulated using the same mechanism. And other memories can transfer between generations. And uh, specifically, I was thinking about the memory of starvation. And the reason is that the biggest epi epidemiological study that has been done on humans, on transmission of responses, between generations was done on, on people that survived uh, uh, um, st starvation in the past. In the Second World War, the Nazis starved large populations in the Netherlands. And people studied their many descendants, the, the descendants of the, the individuals that were starved. And they saw that although there are no changes to their DNA as a result of the starvation, because this can't happen, the descendants suffer more from diabetes, and from other neurological diseases, diseases such as uh, schizophrenia. Of course, this is extremely difficult to study in humans or in mice uh, for, uh, because they're so complex. But I thought maybe worms can explain it. Maybe what's being transmitted here are small RNAs. And this is a different type of inheritance than DNA. It's new rules of inheritance. To study this, we can do a really good starvation experiment in worms because we can really control their conditions. So now he's saying, can you he's done the transmission of behavior from immunity can he simulate the transmission of behavior because of starvation as what we saw in humans i wish he had a french accent hugh everyone can have a french accent you pop le pardon see hugh on and off no problem at all you can do it hugh i believe in you hugh i believe in you hugh so it's a really good starvation experiment allison and so far as it is controlled so the human one, right? Number one, you shouldn't do experimentation on humans because that's unethical. But number two, you cannot, there's the controls aren't there. There's not any, you know, the genetic variance isn't taken care of. Like there's a lot of, can't make any good inferences from that kind of data because there's so many variables at play. But from these worms, I, I know, no, 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 I, I know, Allison. I know, I know, I know totally that you follow. I just try to explain it for others as well because like someone might have that question of like, why would you say that? And it's just like how you can set up an experiment, which I think is not usually well explained of how to design a good experiment with minimal number of variables and why it is important to do so. Because if we just loosey goosey half cocked went in and did an experiment, maybe we'd find something cool, but is it because of what you think is cool or is it because there's a bunch of variables that you didn't account for that led to issues you know what i mean so that's that's more why allison i'm just pointing out that it is for sure interesting phrasing but it is an important thing to do thank you smikes actually smikes you might be wondering what did i say that smikes is a phrase in hungarian that is the pope is sitting on the bench and it is a classic hungarian phrase that you can make french um, there's another one about the back hair of a priest. Um, it's an old Cold War joke. Um, I don't know why it's a Cold War joke. I don't know the origins of why we have it, but I know it originated during the Cold War. Uh, I learned it from my grandfather. 
and apparently that's what you can say to French people who come to Hungary and don't speak Hungarian and that they get confused as to why you're speaking French but you're not really and so Popula Pardon is just one of those Smikes is now like my god Belint I learn more about you every day and I don't know how I feel about this I love your face Smikes so can RNA, if given a delivery mechanism like certain infamous set of vaccines, could memory traits be passed on between species? Astronomy show RNA is, there is maternally deposited RNA, meaning that the mom does pass on RNA to the egg. However, if you take an RNA-based vaccine, it is not going to hit the reproductive organs. It's not going to go in there. So you will not pass on any of that information. Also, the half-life of the RNA, meaning how long it sticks around, is very it's not long enough to then be to survive through development. So the way that RNA is the RNA survives through development based on certain kinds of modifications, those modifications are not present on vaccines. So they number one, they wouldn't get to the reproductive organs. In males, males, um, sperm turns over so rapidly that you'd never be able to hit that in time with eggs the likelihood of them again penetrating and getting into the egg is so low it's not going to happen and then even if they did the half-life would be gone before anything could happen to them so it's there are ways to be able to get rna into the eggs but you have to do a ton of modification for it oh just the delivery method not by injection into the arm or anything like that you'd have to do you have to deliver straight into the reproductive cells and you'd have to modify the RNA to survive through development. And then you might be able to get through it. If that makes sense, astronomy shows. There's a lot of additional factors, but we'd, and there'd be things to work out too, like how exactly all of those components work. Like we just don't know. Chat, what I do know is the new Metallica album was just released. So if anyone enjoys Metallica, 72 seasons just went live on the Apple store. I just got my notification. So what we did is we took worms and we either starved them or not. And when we starved the worms, we found that, uh, um, that they make small RNAs that regulate the function of nutrition-related genes. They regulate the nutrition. But not only that, the interesting part was that these small RNAs moved also to the, grand, to the children, to the grandchildren, and to the great-grandchildren, and protected them and, and changed their, their, their nutrition-related genes as well. And these had real consequences on the physiology, of the physiology of the kids. So the descendants of starved worms lived significantly longer. Which is not anything surprising. There's a lot of data to suggest that starvation actually leads to longer living animals because it, it's it's the effect of metabolism can shorten lifespan and so that's one of the neat ways you're able to live longer is by having um uh regulated and tightly regulated metabolomic signaling Seen uh, Metallica Master of Puppets on Jimmy Kimmel. They're one this week, Hugh. And so, Octavius, it's not just like diet, it's limitation. However, I will say, Octavius, not proven in humans, right? Because you can't do the testing. But there has been multiple shown in different organisms. Uh, Hugh, I, I heard the audio. I haven't seen it yet. Jimmy Kimmel is one who really rubs me the wrong way. Um... I, I, he, I think he thinks he's really funny. And I just don't get it. I like, I just don't get it, Hugh. I, don't, I do not understand how his jokes are multi-million dollar jokes. But I do enjoy Metal. I might watch it. I might watch it. Yeah, but Metal. I, I should watch it, Hugh. I will probably watch it. I'm excited for the new album, Hugh. Um... I, I, periodic fasting may extend lifespan. Yep, exactly. At, at least, Allison, in a lot of model organisms in the lab, it does seem like that is something that is very true. Uh, watch Kimmel when I'm having trouble going to sleep. Yeah, I just don't think any of the late night shows are funny enough to justify their paycheck. And that's not me trying to be sour grapes. It's like I listen to sometimes the highlights of their joke the monologue which is usually my favorite of these kinds of shows and it's just 
It just doesn't do anything for me. He has writers that aren't even his jokes. Yeah, no, but his jokes, Laconic Bites, first time Tatter, welcome on in. Those jokes are not $30 million jokes. Right? And so it's just like, it's just, a lot of them are just duds, and I just don't understand the appeal anymore. Like, I don't know, even Conan had his own stuff, along with writers, and that was much funnier than what's today, like, peddled. I don't know. Or John Stewart's monologue. Back in the day on the Daily Show, those were great. Even Stephen Colbert's, but nowadays it's just like, ah, it's just not that good. Uh, I don't remember what exactly do the nematodes he's talking about inherited epigenetically. So two things, Cliff, that he studied. One is inheritance of immune memory. Um, so they they treated it with virus, and there were small RNAs that were produced to fight off the infection. Um, and that was transmitted to the next generation and a couple of other generations. And then starvation as well. Um, metabolomic regulation was transmitted. So that was also epigenetic. Seth Myers, he can be funny, Allison. I will give you that, yes. He wrote the story for the puppet show that I would totally agree. Together, we can rule the galaxy. Far! Hello, Far! Drive by resub, Farry Wings. Thank you for the resub. How the heck are you doing? You only get one of those prime subs. And you used it on us. Fire Wings, welcome the heck in. Thank you for that resub. I hope you enjoy the ad free viewing, the emotes made with love, and chat. If you're not checking out our friend Far, who does amazing Minecraft gaming extraordinaire, go check out our amazing friend Far. Fire Wings, there we go. There's that fancy pants shout out. There's the fancy pants shout out. Far, appreciate you for the support. Hope all is going well and that you're staying positive as ferret. How's the metabolomic information being transmitted? So those, Cliff, these are changes in the DNA structure. So the, the hypothesis was, and it's been demonstrated that it is um, deacetylation and methylation marks on the DNA and the histones that wrap around tighter and they close off certain sites that would increase uh, metabolism. So it's actually similar. It's a similar mechanism, Cliff, to the monarch butterfly. When the monarch butterfly, um, you know, has that two different um, flight cycles. So when it's flying uh, south, it's flying in pulses versus flying back north. It's in a single flight. And so those, it's this um, growth factor that's being turned down. That's re a master regulator of a bunch of the um, metabolism genes. And so that's what's being similarly regulated in these animals just passed on transgenerationally and eventually brought back as well. Thank you, Kitty Cat Meow. And they, we now know that they are also more protected if you challenge them again with a much more difficult uh, period of starvation. So it seems adaptive. So the DNA methylation is reproduced when it's copied. So it's weird, Cliff. When you undergo reproduction, usually these marks are cleared in mammals especially and so it's strange when mammalian studies they're added back on and it turns out it's this spe special like with the sperm it's these like seminal fluids um like one part of the sperm um like one part of the sperm tract has a, as an organ that actually re-adds everything back in and so it's a similar process during the reproductive line and these nematodes as well where even though everything is cleared there are factors that promote the addition back into these particular sites. So while they don't inherit all the sites that were methylated or acetylated, they are particular ones that are added back in. Now, how that mechanism works is not entirely clear, but I know a lot of folks um, at UMass Worcester have been looking at the mammalian side of things of that and identified again which part of the sperm tract is responsible for the addition back of these marks at least in in mouse and rat models um but there are like for your cells too cliff like when our cells divide um there are like you know there's methylation and acetylation marks that are cleared and put back and so that's different though than it would be for reproductive biology uh, so there are special rna control mechanisms to find the right spots for the marks yep Yep, there's like there's additional marks on the histones, Cliff. So even though that when they're the cells are um, re, like dividing and replicating the DNA, the histones are still there, 
and so the histones will also be tagged and that'll allow for that the dna to still be open but the histone tag can also recruit other acetylators and methylators to a particular site or it could just be the histones are the ones modified not the dna itself and then the histones close up but that also sometimes the histone marks are also cleared during reproduction so it's a similar the similar question still applies cliff and yes smikes we will finish up this video i want to try to get to one more video and then we will wrap up the evening i'll see how long that other video is before i make the final call don't you worry smikes the the holy grail one of the holy grails of this new field is to think about if to, is to think whether the, the brain can generate heritable responses whether memory Generally, there is some evidentiary support for Lamarckism as short-term modifier. Yes. Yes, Allison, indeed. Memories that are formed in the brain are inherited because normally when we think of memories, we think of memories that the brain can, can generate. And these are special memories. And this sounds crazy that you'll think about something, you learn it, and then it will be inherited. But we wanted to study this in worms, and we showed that, in fact, it happens. So small RNA changes in the brains of worms lead to transgenerational changes that affect multiple generations. If you change the population of the production of small RNAs in the brains of the ancestors, it changes the physiology and the behavior of the descendants, even the grand grandchildren. So we've shown that small RNAs that are made in the ancestors' brains are needed so that the, so that the, the kids and the grand, grandkids can search food efficiently. Otherwise, they can't find food, which is also obviously very critical. Since uh, over the years, uh, we, we discovered many types of environments that change that, that lead to transgenerational changes. And now we want to understand the rules of how it happens, because it's very different from the normal rules of genetics that we know essentially for 150 years since the monk Mendel discovered them. And so, for example, we want to know for how long do their responses last. And we found a mechanism that we call the transgenerational timer, which dictates, which governs the duration of the heritable responses. And normally, responses are, are last only three to five generations, and then they are erased. And we found that this clock is constituted from genes, is built on genes that set the exact time. And we can manipulate these genes and control the duration of the response and also make responses that will just last indefinitely and be stable. We call these genes MOTEC genes. It's an acronym that uh, is short for Modified Transgenerational Epigenetic Kinetics, and also MOTEC means sweetheart in, in Hebrew. And now this is, I, I, I'll just, uh, I'm ending here, this is my last slide. I want to say, and this is a very important message that have, has to come across, that we have no idea whether this is happening also in humans. We just don't know, okay? So there's no need to be worried or anything like that, because we have no idea. Many things were discovered in simple organisms and later found to be true in humans, but we have no idea that this is one of them. I sure, certainly hope so, but we don't know. If memories are inherited also in humans, it might mean that you have a greater responsibility for your actions because you're affecting multiple generations. But we don't know that's the case. But I think that regardless of whether memory is inherited in humans or not, it's probably a good idea to act as if it does. So thank you very much. So that was a long workaround for his talk. I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, I like the finish of it as well, is that he does say, like, we don't know the full implication of it. I like that he does go out and say, like, you know, this, this could have very broad-reaching effect on everything. But he's like, hold your horses. We don't actually know that yet. Um, again, I think he gave a very good talk. He's a very good speaker and, again, tempers the data quite well. Um, Octavius, let me find one more item. Um, let's see, this is... I think this is a... Okay. I think this is what we found out earlier. Yeah, so this is just, it's a very short one. It's a quick example on mammalian, the mammalian side of things. This is an older video. I guess it's seven years ago. Wow. It's probably not the most up-to-date data because uh, I, I think I've seen papers much more recent, but it illustrates a similar concept on, on how this one works. Um, it's been a, I am so sorry. I know, Alice. 
Allison is like, <laughs> we started on centipedes, and we got. <laughs> I think we got it on the word, like the genus that we were talking about, and we thoroughly rabbit holed into something totally unrelated. Alice, I am so sorry. Al Alex, I, Alex, I is hardcore. Like, but Octavius had a question. I still think that this was a fun discussion, right? Because transgenerational inheritance and epigenetics is really, really complicated. It is not a straightforward answer. You can see the phenomena that we were talking about between different animals were very, very different in how they actually worked. Um, and so, and, and the topic is not, we have not at all thoroughly covered it either. There are behaviors and methodologies is how this happens that we haven't even touched on it's a beautiful topic and it has so many layers of complexity so octavius thank you for asking the question i appreciate the heck out of you um let's watch this quick video quick explanation on mammals as a teaser maybe we'll do a downstream one on more depth on, on the mammal side of things we didn't just jump into rabbit we, we I was, alex this was a hardcore wormhole into peril yes rabbit hole coming out of my i wouldn't be surprised mikes it is a little empty the sweet smell of fruit doesn't normally send rats running but when researchers paired the orange cherry almondy scent of the chemical acetophenone with a painful electric shock lab rats quickly learned to feel potassium Thank you, Androsese. Spirit. Along the way, extra neurons sprouted in their noses and in the smell processing center of their brains, making them super sensitive to the scent. This result isn't shocking. What is surprising is that the rat's pups and their pups' pups were also startled by the smell of acetophenone. So, Octavius, same idea. Only the parents got exposed, but none of the offspring. But not only was there a behavioral change that was inherited, but changes in the neuro neurological like, connections as well. So the nose had a, new, a de different density of neuronal connections that made them more sensitized to the smell and then had a fear of it. And again, it was not permanent. It was a temporary change. And you can actually look in the paper and you can see an enlarged region of those neurons in the nose. Which is quite remarkable that something like that could happen, right? Um, so it's, again, not just limited to, to insects and worms, but just, like, more and more animals seem like there is something like this to it. And had the same extra neurons as their fathers, despite never having been introduced to either their dads or the fruity scent before. But how could the pups have inherited something that their fathers learned? Basic genetics tells us that only DNA gets passed along to offspring. Characteristics like memories, scars, or giant muscles can't get passed on since acquiring them doesn't alter the genetic code. But it turns out that instilling fear in the rats did trigger genetic changes, not in the DNA sequence itself, but instead in how that code was read and used in the rats' bodies. In every cell, biological machinery constantly translates DNA into the proteins needed to carry out vital processes. Chemical switches attached to the DNA turn genes on or off. So Cliff, these are like the methylation acetylation sites, but one added layer of complexity on this is that DNA is wrapped around a histone, which is like a bead, allows the DNA to become more packed in the cell. Those can also be modified to be open or closed state or up and down, telling the machinery which proteins to produce and in what quantities. These switches, called epigenetic tags, are why a kidney cell looks and acts differently than a skin or nerve cell, even though all three cells have identical DNA. But the switches in any one cell aren't set in stone. Teaching those rats to fear the fruity smell switched one of their smell sensing genes into overdrive. Researchers don't know all the places in the rats' bodies where this switch got flipped, but they know it happened in one key set of cells the rat's sperm cells, which would one day pass along the tweaked genetic material, making the next generation of rats super sensitive to acetophenone. And what's really cool, Cliff, is that this is not permanent in the father. So the paternal lineage doesn't continue to pass on this information forever. Eventually, if you, if you stop giving the, 
a paternal side the shock and the the smell you can actually retrain them to no longer be afraid their sperm reverts back to normal and they'll have offspring that do not have this innate fear so it is very transient not just in the generation time but also in the original passer honor Rodents aren't the only creatures demonstrating this weird type of inheritance. In Ivakalik, Sweden, boys who suffered through tough winter famines went on to have super healthy sons, with extremely low rates of heart disease and diabetes. And their son sons had the same excellent health, living an unbelievable 32 years longer on average than the grandsons of boys who hadn't gone hungry. To be clear, this does not mean that we should start starving our kids for the benefit of future generations. Scientists don't even know yet exactly which switches the Swedish famines flipped. While we have been able to connect specific epigenetic changes to health effects in mice, we're a long way off from being able to make those connections in humans. That may sound like a bummer, but it's mostly because we humans don't live in the well-controlled environment of a laboratory. And for that, we should be grateful. All right. So Octavius, that is a quick, not so deep look at the mammalian side of things. Um, I hope that that was a good rabbit hole and a fun explanation. Um, if anyone has any additional questions, um, y'all can ch you can ask away in the Discord. I will post these videos in the Discord as well, um, so, and some of the resources that we talked about today. So they're under in the mentioned on stream category, on there as well. Um, so there must be a mechanism that transport information to the sensory cells, the egg and sperm. Yes, a cliff in the fruit fly model that we talked about, that is a neuron, neuronal system going from the brain to the ovary and it innervates the ovary and when it does, certain molecules are released and go transfer into the egg. Doesn't mean it's the same in a mammalian system, but it, you can see something maybe similar to it. it implies atypical neurogenesis and some mental differences could be related to environmental factors. Yep. Allison, there's a lot of environmental factors that we don't understand and their effects on us, genetic health, long-term health. A lot of it is just, unfortunately... You don't understand. You don't understand. If you understood, you wouldn't understand. <laughs> We're counting this as one topic, Mike. We are counting this as this. I feel, Octavius, you can tell me, this rabbit hole feels like it's a, it was a three hour rabbit hole. I feel like we can count this as a topic. Usually I don't count rabbit holes in our topics that we cover, but this one was, I feel like sufficient enough where we can count it as a, as a full topic. What do y'all think? Chat! Let's go over to the just chatting screen as we round out the evening.